Westeros, episode 28, Demon of the Trident. Spoilers all books! Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere in Boston. And I'm Yoke Boy in England. And today we have an episode all about Robert Baratheon and Robert's Rebellion. So thanks for tuning in with us. And just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Some of you may know that we recently uh, transitioned to a new podcast provider and therefore amended our RSS feed. So if you use a podcatcher app other than iTunes, please take a moment to stop by our website, RadioWesteros.com, and click on the black and orange RSS button to view the correct feed. Most of our listeners have made the transition seamlessly, but we have discovered that some of the smaller podcatchers and apps didn't update properly, especially with the back catalog, so we think it's a good idea to make sure that your feed is grabbing from the correct place. And of course, if you ever notice anything out of place, contact us at radiowestros at gmail.com. Tell us if you have a problem, okay, and we'll try and solve it. Anyway, let's move on. It's time to talk about Robert Baratheon. Today's episode plays like a double feature, There's the history and character analysis of Robert, and also a very close look at Robert's Rebellion. At over two and a half hours long, this is officially our longest ever episode. It could have been two episodes, but really we couldn't find a place to split. So you have an episode as monstrous as the boar that got Robert. Yeah, it is. And for any new listeners out there, there are plenty of places you can pause the presentation if it seems too long to take in in a single sitting. Then we're going to start today with a look at Baratheon history as we seek to understand how this great house came to create a warrior like Robert, and also we'll look at his own personal background. Then we'll look at the political background of Robert's Rebellion, following which we'll welcome a special guest for two segments. Jim McGeehan, also known as Something Like a Lawyer, has been conscripted from the Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog, producing one piece on the players of the rebellion and one on the rebellion itself, and they will be here presenting those with us. And after that, we'll focus on the aftermath of the war. And finally, we'll look at King Robert as he is in a Game of Thrones to see how victory and the Iron Throne has changed the man. With readings and two pseudo-PSAs, that'll be our episode today. And this is our very first episode that is powered by patrons. We've recently set up a Patreon campaign and wanted to say such a huge thank you to all of you that have signed up. 150 at the time of recording. When we called our banners, you were there for us and we truly appreciate each and every one of you. Yeah, we don't just sit down and press record here. Each episode takes us weeks and weeks of preparation. We aim to bring you specialized, high quality, a song of ice and fire infotainment. If you want to support us and help us continue through the winds of winter and beyond, then come and pledge your sword to us on Patreon. Your pledge is per episode, and as a point of reference, we made eight episodes in 2016. And for as little as $3 per episode, you'll receive reward incentives like access to our upcoming exclusive Patreons episode. It's very easy to sign up and to check out our campaign and other rewards we offer by visiting patreon.com forward slash Radio Westeros. And speaking of patrons and rewards, it's time to recognise a few of our patrons. So a huge shout out to our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington. And also to our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Rory, Ashley, Rosa, Sister Winter and Laura. Yeah, thanks to you guys. And of course, to all our patrons, you're all so awesome. And we will have some more shout outs in the credits. Valyrian Steel level patrons and above, you should be hearing this a whole week before public release, Castle Steel two days before, and you should all automatically be notified of this and other rewards, so please let us know if there's ever a problem. Okay, and so without further ado, let's get to Robert Baratheon and take a look at his history and the history of House Baratheon. (laughs) 
His father had talked of him often. The peerless Robert Baratheon, demon of the Trident, the fiercest warrior of the realm, a giant among princes. Okay, so we'll begin today by taking a historical overview of House Baratheon and move on to Robert's parents' informative years. House Baratheon was founded by Aurys Baratheon, who was rumoured to be the bastard half-brother of Aegon the Conqueror. Aurys was a fierce general during Aegon's invasion, who, in a single combat known as the Last Storm, slew Argilac the Arrogant who we assume was last of the male line of House Durandon. House Durandon, who ruled the Stormlands, had been known as the Storm Kings, and Argilac's demise effectively yielded the so-called impregnable fortress Storm's End to Oris, who became Lord Paramount of the Stormlands, with the designation of Storm King now made obsolete by Aegon's conquest. And Oris was also named Aegon's Hand, and took the daughter of Argilac, named Argella, as his wife. Oris also took the sigil of House Durandon, a crowned black stag on gold, and their words, ours is the fury, as his own to honor Argilac's valor. With his marriage to Argella, he also ensured that the Durandon bloodline continued down to the future Baratheon line. But despite the ancient blood of the Durandans, who dated back to the Age of Heroes, being founded in Aegon I's reign, means that, relatively speaking, House Baratheon is a modern house, in fact, the newest of all the great houses. So this gives the Baratheons the blood of an ancient line on one side, and also possible Targaryen blood on the other, if the rumours about Oris being a Targaryen bastard turn out to be true. And for what it's worth, the World Book does say that this is widely believed. The Baratheons get a more verifiable dose of Targaryen blood further down the line, regardless. And one more notable fact about Oris Baratheon is that he had black hair. And as we learn in A Game of Thrones, from the ponderous tome, The Lineages and Histories of the Great Houses of the Seven Kingdoms, by Grand Maester Malion, this seems to be a very dominant feature of Baratheons, which has led to black-haired children in every instance of a Baratheon-Lannister union, except for that of Robert and Cersei, which leads Ned to solve the first mystery of this series, the true parentage of Cersei's children. But anyway, House Baratheon, despite being a newly formed house, definitely had a lot of tradition, pride, and honor, dating back to the days when House Durandon was independent and ruled the Stormlands. We've seen with the Dornish how notions of independence can take a long time to shake off. You can say it about all the kingdoms, really. And as a major house, it wasn't too long before the Baratheons had ambitions of independence of their own. Yeah, if you read the Duncan Egg story, The Hedge Knight, you might remember a character called Lionel Baratheon, known as the Laughing Storm, who fought in the Trial by Seven in 209 AC with Duncan the Tall. He's described in the World Book as a swaggering giant of a man and one of the greatest fighters of his day. Lionel is actually Robert Baratheon's great-great-grandfather, I think we could see the similarities with the swaggering giant description, coupled with the martial prowess, and perhaps a mix of his ambition. Years later, the firm friendship that developed between Lionel and Aegon V, and the Targaryen king's desire to marry his children outside of their own line, saw Lionel's daughter betrothed to Prince Duncan the Small, heir to the throne. Yeah, as the world book says, quote, all was well until Prince Duncan became smitten with the mysterious woman known as Jenny of Oldstones and took her as his wife in defiance of his father the king. And with his daughter, shamed and dishonored, the laughing storm rebelled and rose up against the Iron Throne. That old Turandon pride must have taken over as he crowned himself Storm King, as in the days of old, and took the Stormlands out of the realm. Yeah, and this is very interesting given we'll be exploring Robert and the Rebellion, 
both because of its precedent and its outcome. The Baratheons were, from the offset, a house of great importance to the Targaryens. They were founded by a great warrior and hand and probable brother to Aegon I. One of Oris's female descendants was Jocelyn Baratheon, half-sister to the old King Jaehaerys through their mother, and mother of Rhaenys, the queen who never was Targaryen, from whom House Valerion descended. But now here we see that they are powerful in their own right, producing several great warriors, which the world book says, brought glory on their house, and that they can present a serious problem to their Targaryen cousins. What followed can be called the First Baratheon Rebellion, and serves as a distant precursor for Robert's Rebellion some 38 years later. Right, being founded by a fearless warrior obviously instilled some kind of battle pride in House Baratheon in the Stormlands. We can see how that would not only produce a character like Robert, but also how he would have been revered by his people. It's no surprise that Robert was hailed as the Laughing Storm Reborn. But that earlier rebellion was put down much more easily and diplomatically. Lord Lionel yielded to Sir Duncan the Tall in a trial by combat, which was followed by Prince Duncan the Small renouncing his claim to the throne. And then, in order to appease Lord Lionel, Aegon V wed his daughter Rael to Lionel's son, Ormond Baratheon, and they became Robert's grandparents. Maester Yandel states that it was this match that ultimately led to the end of Targaryen rule in the Seven Kingdoms. The marriage took place at Storm's End, and a year later, Rael had a son, Stefan, who was a page and a squire in King's Landing, and became a close friend of his cousin Ares, and of Tywin Lannister too. Given the eventual animosity between Ares and Tywin, we can wonder if Tywin at some point saw the use of an alliance with the Baratheons. On the other hand, Ares is rumoured to have wanted to replace Tywin with Stefan as hand to the king, so we can see the emergence of a Targaryen-Lannister-Baratheon triangle emerging, with some very interesting dynamics, given the hindsight of what happened later on. Well, anyway, Stefan Baratheon, the grandson of Aegon V, married Cassana Estermont, and she gave him three sons. The eldest was Robert, a born leader, and then there was Stannis, a solemn and dutiful soul, and finally Renly, who is said to resemble a young Robert, although perhaps more in looks than in nature. Armorer Donald Noy of the Night's Watch, the one-time smith at Storm's End who forged Robert's famous warhammer, described the brothers like this. Robert was the true steel. Stannis is pure iron, black and hard and strong, yes, but brittle the way iron gets. He'll break before he bends. And Renly? That one, he's copper. Bright and shiny, pretty to look at, but not worth all that much at the end of the day. An interesting description from Donald Noy. But tragedy befell the Baratheon family when Stefan was sent to the Free Cities by Ares in search of a bride for Prince Rhaegar. After an unsuccessful journey, save picking up a quite wonderful checkered fool who likes to riddle, Stefan and Kasana returned to Westeros. But... In sight of Storm's End, a sudden storm sunk their galley in Shipbreaker Bay, as Robert and Stannis, still boys here, looked on, leaving nothing but death for the crew and a profoundly changed patch face. Here's the passage. The storm came up suddenly, howling, and Shipbreaker Bay proved the truth of its name. The Lord's two-masted galley, Windproud, broke up within sight of his castle. From its parapets, his two eldest sons had watched as their father's ship was smashed against the rocks and swallowed by the waters. A hundred oarsmen and sailors went down with Lord Stephen Baratheon and his lady wife, and for days thereafter, every tide left a fresh crop of swollen corpses on the strand below Storm's End. 
Okay, so an awful turn of events there that must have affected Robert and Stannis, especially deeply, given that they observed the horror unfolding and were unable to do a thing. We get a glimpse of Stannis's torment here when he says, I stopped believing in gods the day I saw the wind proud break up across the bay. Any god so monstrous as to drown my mother and father would never have my worship, I vowed. However, we never get to see Robert's feelings, and so, as readers, we can only guess how much this affected him. It might be worth noting that Stefan went to sea on Ares' orders, and the object of the mission was purely Targaryen interest, so it's quite possible that Robert might just have harboured some kind of grudge against the Targaryens and Rhaegar from his childhood, and that would have made Rhaegar's alleged kidnap of Lyanna all the more unbearable for him. Okay, and after this tragedy, Robert was fostered out to the Eyrie with John Arryn, who seems to have somewhat replaced Stefan as a father figure in his life. By all accounts, Robert enjoyed his years in the Vale, also gaining a foster brother in Ned Stark, and almost a wife too, as a proposal was arranged which saw Robert betrothed to Ned's sister. The bonds that were formed during this time in the Vale between the trio of Robert, Ned, and John Aaron were severely tested and proved to be tremendously strong when they decided to rebel against Ares and the Iron Throne. By then, Robert had become quite a man. Here's a quote. Six and a half feet tall, he towered over lesser men, and when he donned his armor and the great antlered helmet of his house, he became a veritable giant. He'd had a giant's strength, too. His weapon of choice, a spiked iron warhammer that Ned could scarcely lift. And with his leadership, his brotherhood with Ned, and his superb martial abilities, Robert went on to pull down the centuries-old Targaryen rule one warhammer blow at a time, keeping as his royal sigil the same crown stag that had been the banner of House Durandon all those years ago. And with his Targaryen blood giving him the better claim, according to Ned, Robert sealed his throne. But make no mistake, Robert took this one with his warhammer. And just how Robert won his rebellion and what happened in this fierce warrior's reign as king is what we will be discussing in great detail today. In our next segment, we'll take a look at the political background of the rebellion, and so we're going to dial the clock back again to a few years before Robert's birth. Fifteen years passed, when they had ridden forth to win a throne, the Lord of Storm's End had been clean-shaven, clear-eyed, and muscled like a maiden's fantasy. Six and a half feet tall, he towered over lesser men, and when he donned his armor and the great antlered helmet of his house, he became a veritable giant. He had a giant's strength, too, his weapon of choice a spiked iron warhammer that Ned could scarcely lift. In those days, the smell of leather and blood had clung to him like perfume. Okay, so we're going to explore the political background of Robert's Rebellion here, the Corsus Belli, if you will, if you partial to a bit of Latin. And to get there, we're going to go all the way back to a key moment in Targaryen history, the tragedy at Summerhall in 259 AC, where King Aegon V's efforts to hatch dragons led to a fiery inferno that killed the king, numerous members of the royal family and others, including the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Sir Duncan the Tall. Even as Aegon's granddaughter, Rhaella, gave birth to her and her brother Ares's first son, Rhaegar. So, Summerhall was a Targaryen palace that had been the primary residence of Makar I, and thus the childhood home of King Aegon V, known to his family and to us readers as Egg. Due to his unconventional boyhood, traveling the Seven Kingdoms incognito with Sir Duncan the Tall, Aegon had developed a sympathy for the small folk of the realm, and devoted his reign in large part to passing reforms in their favor. 
But needless to say, these reforms had been unpopular with the nobility, some of whom, according to the World Book, had been heard to call the king a, quote, bloody-handed tyrant, intent on depriving us of our God's given rights and liberties. But lack of dragons in the post Aegon III era had actually led to the steady erosion of royal power, and the tragedy at Summerhall was really a result of two of Aegon V's convictions. First, that he needed dragons to support his reforms. As the World Book also tells us, Aegon V was oft heard to say that if only he had dragons, as the first Aegon had, he could have remade the realm anew, with peace and prosperity and justice for all. And secondly, Aegon's dreams of dragons, which convinced him that his desire was a possibility. Maester Aemon, Egg's elder brother, tells Sam in A Feast for Crows, My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them, every one. And because Aegon was outwardly very sane and rational, and had been seen as a reformer who attempted to distance himself from the Targaryen tradition of incest, among other things, the seeming madness of the events at Summerhall, which apparently included sorcerers and wildfire, could only have reinforced the idea that even good Targaryens were subject to the darkness that had stalked the family in the centuries since the Doom. Well, the deaths of Aegon V, Prince Duncan, Sir Duncan, and so many others left the Targaryen dynasty bereft and changed the course of the Seven Kingdoms' history. Aegon's son, Jaehaerys, inherited the throne with his father's death. Jaehaerys was to have married Celia Tully, but had defied his father and married his own sister, Shaira. This followed his older brother Duncan's rejection of both Lionel Baratheon's daughter and his own claim to the throne in favour of marriage to a commoner known as Jenny of Oldstones, as we mentioned in the last segment. Both the prince and his Jenny perished at Summerhall. Aegon's third son, Daron, had preferred the company of a young knight called Jeremy Norridge to that of Elena Redwine, and had died in a rebellion some years previously. And so, in spite of the fact that Aegon's second daughter, Rael, was ultimately wed to Ormond Baratheon, Aegon's reign ended without him achieving that network of alliances he had dreamed of to bind the great families to his own cause. And with Jaehaerys' teenage children, Aerys and Rhaella, wed to each other at the urging of a woods witch who had apparently convinced their father that a prophesied savior prince would be born of their line, there didn't seem to be any new Targaryen alliances in the making, just a diminished royal line struggling against the pressures of the realm. And pressures there certainly were, with the so-called Nine Penny Kings lurking on the stepstones and preparing an invasion of Westeros in support of young Maelie's Blackfyre's claim to the Iron Throne. While Jaehaerys wasn't known as a warrior, he was no fool, and he resolved to bring the battle to the Band of Nine rather than wait upon their invasion. While his hand and good brother, Ormond Baratheon, convinced him not to join the fight himself, his son Ares was a squire in the force that Lord Ormond assembled to go to the Stepstones. And while Ares was the only Targaryen in the army that would confront this new Blackfire threat, the force included representatives of many of the great houses. From the west came Lord Tytos Lannister's sons, Tywin, Tiggett, and Kevin, and his brother Jason, along with 11,000 men. From the Riverlands, Hoster and Brynden Tully, and the new young Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, Sir Gerald Hightower. From the Stormlands, Lord Ormond, the Hand, and his son Stefan, and with them a young knight called Barristan Selmy. From the Iron Islands, Lord Quellon Greyjoy came with a hundred longships. And from the Vale, Lord John Arryn, along with an obscure lord named Baelish. And because we know the Warden of the North was activated along with his counterparts in the East, West, and South, it's safe to assume that young Rickard Stark was also present. 
So months living as brothers in arms during the time that the Westerosi host waged war on the Stepstones led to several friendships being formed that would have no small impact on the future of Westeros. Hoster Tully befriended the insignificant Lord Baelish from the Fingers and eventually took his son, Peter, to Foster. And it must have been at this time that Stefan Baratheon and Rickard Stark became friends and got to know Lord John Arryn, who would end up fostering the other two men's sons in the Vale. Yeah, it seems obvious that a lot of the alliances that were in the background of Robert's Rebellion were formed during those months in 260 AC when the flower of Westerosi chivalry took the battle to the Band of Nine on the Stepstones. These friendships ultimately resulted in four of the Lords Paramount, Stark, Tully, Aaron, and Baratheon, planning dynastic alliances and marriages such as never had been seen in the Seven Kingdoms. And there was evidently an attempt to involve a fifth great house, with the proposed marriage of Jaime Lannister to Liza Tully, which seems to have been foiled only by Cersei Lannister's untimely intervention. And more on that later, but there were other consequences of the war as well. The Hand and Commander of the Army, Lord Ormond Baratheon, was one of the first to die, leaving his son Stefan as his heir and Gerald Hightower in command of the army. The new Hand was apparently one Edgar Sloane from a minor house in the Reach. Jason Lannister, the commander of the Westerland forces and father of Tywin's future wife Joanna, was also killed. And Barristan Selmy's heroic slaying of Maylie's Blackfire in single combat ultimately decided the conflict in a single stroke and led him to being named to Jaehaerys' Kingsguard. All in all, the war in the Stepstones seems to have set up the next generation to be one of friendships and grand alliances. But in 262, just three years into his reign, Jaehaerys II, who had never enjoyed robust health, died, leaving the throne to pass to his young son Ares, just 18 years old. And one of the first things Ares did was name his friend Tywin Lannister, whom he had known since childhood, as his hand, dismissing the older and more cautious Edgar Sloan. In fact, the world book tells us that Ares set about appointing many new and younger counsellors in place of all of the older, more experienced men who had served his father and grandfather. Tywin Lannister was the youngest hand in the history of the Seven Kingdoms, but had already proved himself to be a ruthless and effective leader in his campaign to bring stability back to the Western Lands, which had been an open revolt on several occasions during Tywin's lifetime. His obliteration of the rebellious Tarbex and Reigns of Castamere became the stuff of Westerosi legend, as Ares was a charming and spirited young prince who enjoyed a variety of entertainments and, quote, grand schemes, having someone of Tywin's more serious demeanor to handle the business of ruling must have seemed a gift from the gods at first. However, as Ares grew older, pride and arrogance began to take the upper hand in his personality, and he grew increasingly resentful of Tywin's influence. Add to that an apparent rivalry or jealousy between the two men in the matter of Tywin's wife, Joanna, and in time, the relationship between the two men frayed from a close friendship to being outright antagonistic. The World Book records Ares humiliating his hand on several occasions and refusing to accept his resignation when Tywin tried to give it. And so Tywin Lannister remained in King's Landing as Hand for nearly 20 years. In the meantime, we're told that Rhaegar, born on the day Summerhall burned, grew up to be melancholic but dutiful and learned. Robert Baratheon, born in the first year of Ares' reign to Ares' cousin Stefan and Eddard Stark, born the following year, were fostered with John Arryn at the Eyrie. Eddard's brother Brandon was betrothed to Hoster Tully's daughter Catelyn, while Lyanna Stark was promised to Robert Baratheon. 
It's plain from the record that Tywin Lannister harbored hopes of marrying his daughter Cersei to Prince Rhaegar, in spite of Rhaegar's eventual marriage to Elia of Dorne. And we hear in A Feast for Crows and in the World Book that there was a match between Jaime Lannister and Lysa Tully in the making. Yeah, we discussed Tywin's plans for marrying his children off in our Tywin episode, if you've heard that one, with the takeaway that there was something positively strange about it, as he rebuffed the plans his wife Joanna had laid prior to her death in favour of a much less clear course of action that involved primarily keeping Cersei at his side in King's Landing, no doubt with the hopes of catching Prince Rhaegar's eye. Rhaegar's marriage to Elia of Dawn, who was reputed to be frail and sickly, seemed to bother him not at all, and the irony that his late wife had at one time hoped to marry their son Jamie to Elia seemed lost on him, if not on us readers. Right. So we mentioned in the last segment that Robert's father, the king's cousin, Stefan, perished with his wife in a shipwreck after a trip to Essos on the king's business, searching for a suitable Valyrian bride for Prince Rhaegar. The loss of Stefan and Lady Cassana was a huge blow to their children, and as we said, we do wonder if Robert harbored resentment against his royal cousins for their part in his parents' death. It would seem only natural, although it's never explicitly mentioned. But in spite of fissures that grew as Ares' reign progressed, the basic alliances forged during the War of the Nine Penny Kings remained in place as that generation of young men grew up and raised their own families to adulthood. Five of the ruling lords paramount during Ares' reign had served together on the Stepstones, and the son of a sixth now ruled the Stormlands. Of these six families, four had definite plans to ally themselves by marriage, and there seems to have been plans in the work to involve a fifth, the Lannisters. And these alliances are the basis of the idea that has somewhat taken hold in the fandom that those lords plotted to form a power block that could force the monarchy to bend to their own will. Many fan analysts have discussed the subject since Stefan Sarse of Tower of the Hand published his essay Southern Ambitions. And with the publication of the World Book, we received enough new information that made a whole crop of further analysis possible. With all that in mind, we can take some time to talk about the plotting and factionalism that took root in Westerosi politics late in Ares' reign, as that is the true backdrop of Robert's Rebellion. So, always proud and easily flattered, Ares grew into a suspicious and paranoid man, His sister queen, Rhaella, suffered numerous miscarriages and stillbirths, and Rhaegar remained their only child until the birth of Prince Viserys in 276. The catalogue of things that fed the king's growing madness and paranoia could take hours to relate, so suffice it to say that as his mental stability suffered, his relationships with those closest to him disintegrated into near-open hostility. The queen was held practically captive to prevent her being unfaithful, which Ares was sure was the cause of her many failed pregnancies. And as we mentioned, Lord Tywin was repeatedly humiliated by the king, although Ares seemed absolutely unwilling to lose his one-time friend as hand, either having a cynical wish to keep using Tywin's obvious talents at governing, or being afraid to have him out of sight. Yeah, it's clear Ares was afraid of many things and suspected plotting on many fronts. But perhaps nothing illustrates the king's descent into madness better than the defiance of Duskendale in 277, when, in direct opposition to the advice of his hand, the king went to personally treat with the rebel Lord Darklin of Duskendale and was promptly taken captive along with his guard, some of whom were killed as they tried to defend him. And while many wanted Tywin to go reigns of Castamere on Tuskendale, the threat to Ares's person was too great, and Tywin instead surrounded the town and prepared for a lengthy siege. 
And the World Book tells us that in the final days before Ares was rescued, Tywin met with the council regarding his plans to demand a surrender, which weren't exactly gentle, but he was met with the objection that Lord Darklin could kill the king if Tywin was too demanding. And, allegedly, Tywin's response to that was this. He may or he may not, but if he does, we have a better king right here. Whereupon he raised a hand to indicate Prince Rhaegar. Well, Sir Barristan Anselmi's eventual rescue of the king was legendary. But Barristan himself recalled, If he had not gone into Duskendale to rescue Ares from Lord Darklin's dungeons, the king might well have died there as Tywin Lannister sacked the town. Then Prince Rhaegar would have ascended the Iron Throne, mayhaps to heal the realm. Duskendale had been his finest hour, Yet the memory tasted bitter on his tongue. Okay, so hints there from Tywin and Barristan that some in the realm were beginning to look to the crown prince as a possible antidote to his father's troubled reign. And the reasons for Barristan's reservations, of course, are that, quote, from that day forth, the king's madness reigned unchecked. Ares had House Darklin and their bannermen of House Hollard all but exterminated. He wouldn't allow blades of any kind near his person going forward, and in his heightened paranoia he refused to meet with Tywin, whom he suspected of plotting to overthrow and kill him, except in the presence of all seven Kingsguard. He brought the eunuch Varys to King's Landing from Pentos to serve as his spymaster, and he developed an obsession with wildfire, no longer using a headsman to dispense justice, but instead using the services of the Pyromancer's Guild to burn his enemies alive with wildfire. Yes, grim stuff. So, with the king locked in the throes of madness, and now known to many of his subjects as the Mad King... No one was exempt from his paranoia, not even his own wife and son, whom Ares was convinced opposed him. And because there will always be those people in politics who will use others' weaknesses to their advantage, a party grew up around him of people eager to play the dangerous game of currying favour with a madman for their own benefit. And, as if in support of the king's suspicions, a party of more reasonable people surrounded the crown prince who had married Elliot of Dawn early in 280 and taken up residence on Dragonstone. And so we arrive at the year 281, the year of the so-called False Spring, Jamie Lannister's appointment to the King's Guard, Aerys's final break with Tywin Lannister, and the tourney of Harrenhal. On the verge of a marriage alliance between Jamie Lannister and Lysa Tully, Cersei Lannister contrived to convince King Aerys to name her brother to his king's guard, thinking to keep him in King's Landing, where she also lived in the company of their father. Sadly for Cersei, the loss of his son and heir to the celibate order of the king's guard proved to be the final straw for her father, who resigned his post as hand and retreated to Casterly Rock with Cersei in tow. In the meantime, not long after a visit from his brother Sir Oswell Went of the Kingsguard, Lord Walter Went of Harrenhal had announced a grand tourney in celebration of his daughter's name day. It was to be the greatest tourney of the day, and lords and knights from the entire realm planned to attend to compete for prizes which would be three times greater than those offered by Lord Tywin at the lavish tourney he had hosted in Lannisport in honour of Prince Viserys' name day five years previously. So, the scale of the tourney itself and the prizes offered led many to believe that House Went had a shadow host. In the world book, Maester Yandel suggests that this could have been Prince Rhaegar himself as part of a plan to hold a secret council with the lords of the realm to depose his father. If that was the plan, it was a good one that should have worked since Ares hadn't left the Red Keep since Duskendale and traveling to the Riverlands seemed to be out of the question for the king. But others suggest that if there was a shadow financier, it might be more wise to disregard Maester Yandel, who is notoriously biased, 
and looked to the man who not only had an outsized grudge against Ares, but who had more money than any other lord in the kingdom, and to whom the crown was already in debt during Ares's reign, and that's Tywin Lannister, of course. Yeah, and in support of that idea, we'd point to Tywin's alleged words about Rhaegar during the Siege of Duskendale, we have a better king right here, and the fact that it was in response to Tywin's strongly worded objections that Ares went to Duskendale in the first place, prompting some to wonder if the Hand had planned at least some part of what followed. Add to that his apparent long-standing ambition to wed his daughter Cersei to the crown prince, and the fact that on the eve of the tourney, he was apparently about to buy into the block of lords forming marriage alliances, which many see as a bid for power over the monarchy. Well, whatever the case, inspired by the whispers of Varys the Spider, Ares decided to attend the tourney in a fit of paranoia. The assembled nobility were shocked by his appearance, as the king hadn't cut his hair and nails in years due to his fear of blades. Also, his behaviour, fluctuating from mirth to melancholy to bouts of rage, was cause for grave concern among his lords. And then there was his legendary paranoia. Yeah, Ares was suspicious of everyone, his son, as we mentioned, and any of the lords and knights who were known to be his associates, but also, more broadly, of his host, Lord Went, and all the competitors, any of whom, in his eyes, could have been part of the conspiracy against him. And he was suspicious of Tywin Lannister, who stayed away, apparently nursing his grudge against the king at Casterly Rock, for the tourney was the occasion Ares had chosen to invest Jaime Lannister into his king's guard. But immediately after Jaime was confirmed to the cheers of the crowd, Ares began to suspect him as well. He was Tywin's son, after all, and as a king's guard, he would now be at Ares' side, every day bearing a sword. And so Jaime was sent back to King's Landing to guard the Queen and Prince Viserys, who had not been allowed to attend. We know of Jaime's disappointment from his own POV, but might have expected that to be the end of Ares' paranoia on that front. Except for one thing. Yeah, we've discussed the Night of the Laughing Tree previously, and the fandom's fairly broad acceptance that this was Lyanna Stark in disguise, defending the honor of her friend Howland Reed. But the king's paranoia was so great that he became convinced that the mystery knight who appeared at the tourney was Sir Jaime, returned to make mock of him. And so Ares was determined to have the mystery knight unmasked, But when he failed to appear on the next day, the king became sure that someone had warned him off and referred to the knight as, quote, a traitor who will not show his face. Amira Reed's tale tells us the king was wroth and even sent his son the dragon prince to seek the man. But all they ever found was his painted shield hanging abandoned in a tree. The rest, as they say, is history. The Dragon Prince won the tourney and crowned Lyanna Stark, the wolf maid, queen of love and beauty. The moment the smiles died has been focused upon as the flashpoint of Robert's rebellion, with the world book telling us that Robert's heart, quote, hardened towards the Prince of Dragonstone from that day forth. But we mentioned in our net episode that perhaps we should take that assessment with a grain of salt. And of course, there could be mitigating factors. Was Rhaegar honoring Lyanna for her deeds as the Mystery Knight? Was he, as some of his father's toadies suggested, attempting to curry favor with Lord Rickard Stark? Or was he simply smitten with a lovely young woman? Well, the truth of it may never be known given the outcome of the war, but we've wondered... What might have happened if the paranoid king had discovered the truth behind the mystery knight's identity, remembering Ario Hotar's words to Ariane Martel, someone told, someone always tells. 
given his predisposition to the Mystery Knight being no friend of his, and Rhaegar's honouring of Lyanna as the Queen of Love and Beauty, if the king discovered her deception in the weeks following the tourney, might he have assumed she was part of some plot involving his son? And if so, think about how he might have reacted, perhaps by sending men to seize the girl, and hearing word of this, might Rhaegar have suddenly hastened into the Riverlands in an attempt to rescue her? We've discussed this often enough, and it's actually one of our Radio Westeros pet theories, that we can leave it here as food for thought and focus on what we know for sure. The World Book tells us, With the coming of the new year, the Crown Prince had taken to the road with half a dozen of his closest friends and confidants on a journey that would ultimately lead him back to the Riverlands, not ten leagues from Harrenhal, where Rhaegar would once again come face to face with Lyanna Stark of Winterfell, and with her light a fire that would consume his house and kin and all those he loved, and half the realm besides. So whether we're dealing with a rescue, an elopement the kidnap of a young girl out of lust, or the desire to see a prophecy fulfilled, or even a mix of some of these things, we know that the outcome of the situation had grave repercussions across the realm. Lyanna's brother Brandon charged to King's Landing and stood before the Red Keep, demanding that the Crown Prince come out and die. For that action, which Catelyn termed rash, while her father called Brandon a gallant fool, Brandon was arrested along with his companions, Ethan Glover, Kyle Royce, Elbert Arryn, and Geoffrey Malister. And we're told that the king sent for their fathers to come answer for their sons and then executed them all, except Ethan Glover, for some unknown reason. Glover would spend the next year or so in the Black Cells until he was freed by Ned Stark following the sack of King's Landing. The rest were executed, including Lord Rickard, who demanded a trial by combat and was made to face Ares's champion, Wildfire, while Brandon, bound round the neck by a devious harness that prevented him reaching his own sword by mere inches, watched his father burn and strangled himself trying to save him. So a couple of points there. One is that Rickard does not appear to have demanded his daughter's return, but rather a trial by combat to free his son, almost as if he knew that Lyanna and Rhaegar would not be found in the Red Keep. Secondly is the curious case of Ethan Glover, who is the only member of Brandon's party to survive. And then months later again is the only member of the group Ned took with him to the so-called Tower of Joy who might have had an opportunity to speak personally with Rhaegar and altogether this makes us very suspicious of the reason that George permitted Ethan Glover to live. Yeah, and we'll be covering some more of this in an upcoming segment, but Rhaegar eventually did return to King's Landing, quote, from the south. And not only does Ned have knowledge of where to find his sister after the war, but he knows that Rhaegar called the place the Tower of Joy. This is something that hasn't been focused on. In fact, I've personally never seen it discussed in the fandom. But we think it's important to note that Ned's knowledge of Rhaegar's name for the location implies that he spoke to someone who spoke to Rhaegar after his return to King's Landing. And as we see it, Ethan Glover is an excellent candidate. Yeah, he could have been the one who told Ned where to find Lyanna after the war and that the place was called the Tower of Joy by the late prince and to return to the aftermath of the executions of not only the Starks, but of members of several prominent families from the North, Rivlands and Vale, including Lord John Arryn's nephew and heir, Elbert, what Ares did next almost certainly guaranteed open revolt by certain of his lords. He sent word to Lord Arryn in the Eyrie to execute his one-time foster sons, Eddard Stark and Robert Baratheon, who were with him there, and send their heads to him at King's Landing. 
Well, John Aaron was certainly in a no-win situation there, as we'll be discussing in our next segment, and we can speculate that Ares intended the same fate for House Stark in particular as that of the Darklands and Hollards, but many wonder why he demanded his cousin Robert's head. Perhaps it was because, as Lyanna's betrothed, he could be expected to take strong action to avenge Rhaegar's alleged kidnap. And it's been suggested, notably by Stefan Sasse, that perhaps someone, namely Varys the Spider, might have whispered this into the king's ear. As we'll see, Robert certainly did fall for the kidnap and rape narrative. In a way, his friend Ned doesn't seem to have at all. And so his rage ultimately confirmed this narrative. But no matter what the ambitions of the Lords of the Realm had been, or their intentions with regard to the Crown Prince, John Arryn's refusal to deliver the heads of his wards meant commitment to a full-scale rebellion that was never intended. And before long, Lords and Knights were taking sides in the Vale and across the Realm and becoming embroiled in fights and skirmishes. Yeah, this conflict would quickly engulf the Seven Kingdoms, with Robert Baratheon framed as the primary affronted party, although it might seem to us, looking back, that the Starks were actually the most affected dynasty. In our upcoming segments, we'll be discussing the players and the progress of the rebellion itself. But first, here's a message from the Mad King himself. Know ye, lords and freeholders of the Seven Kingdoms, and listeners of Radio Westeros. Ares Targaryen, second of his name, King of the Andals and the Rhoynar and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm, commands you to yield forth all information regarding the whereabouts of the rebel Robert Baratheon. Said rebel Robert is henceforth deemed traitor to the realm, denounced, attainted, and stripped of all rank and titles, of all lands and incomes and holdings, and sentenced to death. Those loyal and leal subjects who contribute to bringing this rebel to the crown's justice shall be duly rewarded. And those who join him in his rebellion, by word, deed, or omission, shall be likewise deemed traitors and subject to the king's justice. May the gods have mercy upon the souls of all traitors and continue to bless the reign of our good King Ares. When it comes to warfare, we have to look at the leaders of each side and the objectives they've set out. Not every belligerent seeks the same thing, after all, and these objectives give insight as to why the actors make the decisions they make, and how they carry them out on the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. And for an introduction to the players in Robert's Rebellion, we're joined by Jim McGeehan of the Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog for the first of two segments he's prepared for us today. Hello, Jim, and welcome to Radio Westeros. We are delighted to have you join us to lend your expertise in military analysis as we cover a topic that's so important to the foundation of A Song of Ice and Fire. Hi, Lady Gwyn. Happy to be here. And I'm looking forward to going through the Rebellion itself later with Yolk Boy. But first, you and I are going to go over the key players which I think we all agree is an important starting place. Both sides have their senior leadership and major subordinate commanders, and several prominent actors took no part in the initial outbreak of the war, making them potential allies, enemies, or just intriguing wrinkles in the operational and strategic battle space. So there's actually quite a bit of ground to cover. Yeah, there is. You suggested that the rebels are the easiest to understand because their objectives are overt and unified. So let's start with them. At the outset of the war, the principal rebels are Robert and Eddard. These two are both young men, under 20 years old, and heads of their respective regions. But besides that, the two couldn't be more different. Robert was brash and boisterous, endlessly charming, and one of the strongest fighters of his day. Eddard was thoughtful and methodical, patient and grim. Opposites attracted in this case, and the two were the best of friends. And both men had a single purpose at the outset of the rebellion. They had been marked for death by royal writ, so their objective was first and foremost to stay alive and defend themselves. The two also had deeply personal motivations against the crown, 
stemming from the supposed abduction of Lyanna Stark, Eddard's sister and Robert's fiancée, by Rhaegar Targaryen, crown prince of the Seven Kingdoms. Eddard had additional motivation, and some might even argue that it's his primary motivation, to bring his family's and Bannerman's murderer to justice, and to stop this sort of thing from happening again. Now, both Ned and Robert had been wards of Lord John Arryn and were in the Vale when Ares called for their heads. John Arryn held one of the highest ranks of lordship and was over 60, among the oldest of the higher-ranking lords. He had already served in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, as we mentioned, and he was politically tied to both the Starks and the Baratheons. John Arryn's motives are also easy to determine. Commanded by the king to violate his guardianship contract... Aaron's refusal meant that he was also marked for death by the Targaryen regime. Uh, that's right, Lady Gwyn. Aaron was put into a zhuzhuang, a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario, by Ares II. If he complied with the demand, he would have forsaken one of the most preciously held concepts in Westeros. But if he refused, he was a traitor to the realm. Forced into a difficult decision, John Aaron made the choice to fight for the rebels. So the one rebel who didn't have the same threats to his person is Hoster Tully, Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. Hoster Tully was certainly an ambitious man. He had attempted to marry off his daughters to both the Starks and the Lannisters. One alliance had fallen through not so long before when Jaime Lannister was named to the Kingsguard, and the other more recently when Catelyn lost the now deceased Brandon Stark. However, the Tullys weren't on the chopping block in the way the other rebels were. Ares wasn't calling for Catelyn's head, or Hoster's for that matter, the way he was calling for Robert's and Eddard's. However, Ares had also seized and executed two members of the Malister family, a family which owed their allegiance to the Tullys, so Hoster couldn't just sit the war out, lest his other vassals feel he wasn't offering them his protection. Overall, however, we can see that the rebels presented a fairly unified front with coterminous objectives. And at first glance, the royalists would also have the same objectives from the king down to loyal vassal, the pacification of the rebellion and the continued security of the royal family. Yet not long before, Lord Owen Merriweather, then the hand of the king, had noted that the court was divided between Rhaegar and Ares Targaryen. Factional differences dominated the royal court, and this period in time would be no exception. Right, Ares II had been looking to exert sole and supreme power within his kingdom since his coronation. He desired to crush the rebellion, execute the rebellious lords paramount, and permanently eliminate all threats to his rule. Now, given his mental instability and the previous experience at Duskendale, Ares was attacking this problem not with the scalpel, but with the axe. And so the Starks, Aarons, and Baratheons, one and all, would suffer the fate of the Darklands and Hollards should Ares have his way. Rhaegar, however, is much more mysterious in his motives, because he never shared them with the greater public or recorded them for posterity. He was certainly inclined to want to protect his life and his position as heir to the Iron Throne, but the reasons to why he abducted Lyanna, the actions that set the wheels in motion for the rebellion, were unknown to the Westerosi public, and this led people to invent all sorts of wild theories. On one hand, from Robert himself, you have the vision of Rhaegar as a rapacious fiend, stricken by the beauty of Lyanna, who descended upon her and stole her away to his secret lair, no doubt cackling maniacally as he did so. The Targaryen account, as laid down by the self-styled Viserys III, is that Lyanna and Rhaegar were one true love's eloping, and Rhaegar fought the war to keep the woman he loved. Obviously, there's no small amount of bias in both of these accounts, depending on how the war itself is viewed, with the truth only known to a select few individuals. And while Rhaegar himself was missing for a good portion of the initial war, the pro-Rhaegar faction did have a prominent champion in Lord John Connington of Griffin's Roost. A Stormlander, Connington elected not to follow his liege lord, but instead fought for the crown due to his close friendship with Rhaegar Targaryen. As boys, the two had served as fellow squires, but Connington's attraction seems to have been a bit deeper than that. From his own point of view, it appears he was infatuated with Rhaegar. So, unlike other actors, Connington had no great political goals, only personal ones with military and political means. Connington desired to destroy Robert and prove his own worth and value to his silver prince. 
Connington was a young man, and for him, this sense of worth and value was tied to his skill at set-piece battle, and as such, he would attempt to wage traditional battles to beat the rebels on the field. Yeah, and while many of the senior lords sided with the rebels, two of them sided with the crown, Lord Mace Tyrell of the Reach and Prince Doran Martell of Dorne. Prince Doran was hardly excited about the prospect of civil war. Rhaegar had insulted his wife Elia Martell, Doran's sister, by abducting Lyanna Stark, and he was a cautious, patient man besides, loath to commit a large number of resources to a risky campaign. Yet his objectives were still quite clear. His family was married into the royal line with Elia, and her and Rhaegar's infant son Aegon was the heir to the heir and would provide House Martell with an incredible amount of political influence when he eventually assumed the Iron Throne. Lady Elia and both of her children were also in the Red Keep, along with Doran's uncle, Lewin Martell, one of Ares' Kingsguard. Should Doran have desired perhaps to sit the war out, or even more underhandedly, eliminate Ares and Rhaegar and install the infant Aegon with himself as a regent, four of his family members would be hostages in danger of execution, putting an end to that sort of scheme almost immediately. Duran's objective really boiled down to one key point, preserve House Martell, especially Elia and her two children, who would be in danger if the rebels won, or if King Ares doubted Duran's loyalty. If he could win, and Aegon's future remained secured, then Prince Duran could maintain his position as one of the most powerful lords of the realm. Now, Lord Mace Tyrell is an interesting case because he has no ties to either side in the war. He has no marriages or fosterages. It's not even clear if any of the senior leaders on either side associated much with Mace in either a formal or informal capacity. He was, however, a politician of his age, looking to advance his family's power and influence over the Seven Kingdoms. Mace was looking to defeat the rebels and advance to a position of especial prominence within the court. And if Mace commanded the single largest detachment of royalist forces, he was in a prime position should he win. While he couldn't supplant Doran as an in-law to the current heir, should he become the hero of the realm, much and more would be open to him, whether it be court positions, betrothals, or influence in directing policy and adjudicating disputes in favor of House Tyrell. All right, but not every senior lord desired to join the war. And unlike Doran Martell, some lords had more success in remaining uninvolved. The most prominent of these was the former Hand of the King, Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock. Tywin was a veteran politician and warrior who had spent a long time working on behalf of the crown, first in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, and later as Hand of the King for King Aerys. But their relationship had soured, once Ares had made it clear that he would not tolerate gossip that named Tywin as the de facto ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, to the point of slicing the tongue of Tywin's retainer, ill in pain, as well as other petty mockeries. Other than the proposed marriage alliance between Lysa Tully and Jaime that had come to naught when the latter joined the Kingsguard, he had no connection to the rebel coalition. On the other hand, like Duran, one of Tywin's family members was a Kingsguard member and thus a hostage in Ares' court, preventing him from openly siding with the rebels. However, that could work in reverse as well. A hostage is a single-use weapon. Once you kill the hostage, you lose the power that the hostage granted. So if Ares attempted to harm Jaime to force Tywin into action, it could easily have pushed him into the rebels' camp out of vindictive revenge. And when it comes to Tywin's objectives... Tywin had long made it his goal to establish the Lannister name into a position of dominance, reversing the decline his house had suffered under his father. Had he entered the wrong side of the war, all his long work would have been for naught. Thus, he needed to consider his moves very carefully. And also setting out this war was the aging Lord Quellen Greyjoy, another veteran of the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Lord Quillen had for years sought to increase ties between the Iron Islands and the Seven Kingdoms, bringing maesters in education to the High Lords of the Iron Isles and ravens to carry messages back and forth. He sought to end practices which set the Ironborn apart from the rest of Westeros, such as thraldom and reaving. At first glance, Lord Quillen seems to be the type of lord to have joined the war on one side or the other, strengthening ties completely, but two big problems stuck out at him. The first was simple. 
The war was primarily on the east coast of Westeros, which meant that the Ironborn would need to sail all the way around Dorne to strike at either Robert or Ares in a meaningful fashion. The second is that the risk of loss had the potential to undo all of Quellen's reforms. Loss of prestige and a backslide could lead to a popular uprising among the Ironborn, and a popular uprising could easily hone in on Quellen's reforms, unpopular with the fundamentalist worshippers of the Drowned God. Quellen might be 6'6 and strong and quick with a long axe, but he would be hard-pressed to fight two-thirds of the Iron Islands by himself. Thus Quellen, unwilling to risk his hard-earned reforms, did not immediately declare for either side, instead observing the war from the safety of the Iron Islands. Okay, so what's really striking about these commanders is that about half of them are young men who are getting their first taste of war. Robert, Eddard, John Connington, and Prince Rhaegar himself are all young men around 20 years old. They'd never experienced warfare before. In fact, the closest they'd ever been to war was the tourney field or the melee circle. Right, and that none of these young men, or any of the other young commanders, were noted to balk at the grim task of war shows that their objectives were firmly held in their minds. For all of them, the accomplishment of those objectives was of paramount importance, enough so that they were willing to put their lives on the line and willing to fight to achieve them. That says something about the mindset of these commanders, and that's why in this war you see very few defections. They all believed in their cause so strongly that their causes remained united up until victory was either assured or out of reach. Certainly helped by the fact that one of the primary objectives for the war on both sides was the death of the other party. We'll see it play out on the battlefield that no matter how bleak it gets, both sides are ready to fight. Yes, we will see that. So it's really been great talking with you today, Jim. Thank you for being with me. My pleasure. And now that we've been introduced to the main players, it's time to dive into an analysis of the Rebellion itself. Jim has provided the analysis for that segment as well, and so he'll be continuing on with Yoke Boy in just a moment. But before they begin, we have another public service announcement for our listeners. Attention, all residents of the Seven Kingdoms and listeners of Radio Westeros. Robert Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End, does implore you to support by word and deed, his defiance of the false king Ares, who by his deeds has broken covenant with his subjects and abandoned his duty as liege lord and protector of the realm. The mad king has proved himself unsuited to hold the seat of power through the foul murder of his leal servants, Rickard and Brandon Stark and others, and the unjust decrees against their heirs and others. With your support, we will rid the realm once and for all of King Scab and the vile, abhorrent course of his reign. Those who rise in support of our cause shall be rewarded with our eternal friendship, and those who have opposed us shall be pardoned if they relent, or face the wrath of the Warhammer if they do not. May the gods have mercy on us all. Okay, Robert Baratheon's call to arms there. And if you listeners believe in Robert's cause, don't forget to volunteer. And now we have Jim from Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog back to discuss the rebellion with us. So far we've looked at the background and all the players, and now we're going to walk through the course of the rebellion conflict by conflict. Hello Jim. Hi Oak Boy, glad to be here to talk with you about the battles of Robert's rebellion, uh, at least the ones we know about. Since there appears to be a gap between the Battle of the Bells and the Battle of the Trident, there could have been other, smaller conflicts that we haven't heard about, but these are the major ones that we hear about during A Song of Ice and Fire and from the World Book. Right, and we have nine major conflicts to consider today, and we're looking forward to presenting Jim's analysis here. So, to get us started, let's recap that the hostilities began when Ares II demanded the heads of young Robert Baratheon and his foster brother, Eddard Stark, who were at the time visiting their foster father, John Arryn of the Vale, and thus under his protection. As mentioned in the last segment, it was a tough position for Lord Arryn to be in, but ultimately his decision was clear. No matter what the outcome, he would refuse the king's demand. Town. And so, of course, when that refusal came, it meant war. There was no other alternative. 
The hand of the king at the time was Lord Owen Merriweather, a friendly man, but not a capable one. Up until this point, he had been known largely through throwing the largest feast and laughing the loudest at the king's jokes. Lord Owen thought that he could win the battle with words, and so he sent out missives demanding that the nobles execute the rebels, and never once stirred from the capital, dumping the risk to subordinates while he remained safe in the Red Keep. Most nobles didn't take Owen up on his order, but a few of them listened and drew up arms in favor of House Targaryen. One of these lords was Mark Grafton, the Lord of Gulltown. Right, and Eddard and Robert couldn't remain in the Eyrie. They needed to return to their own strongholds to marshal their own troops. It was simple enough for Eddard. He needed to just head north across the Bight. But Robert couldn't march south without going past King's Landing, too close to Ares and Royalist forces. He would need to sail to Storm's End to rally his own forces, and that meant he would need to sail from the Vale's only port, Gulltown. So John Arryn marshalled his forces and marched, intent on taking the port. Yes, and this would be Robert Baratheon's first battle, and it would be a trial by fire. Attacking a city is easier than attacking a castle, since a city is designed to be accessible, while a castle is designed to be a fortress, but it's still no easy task. The walls of the city are a potent defensive multiplier, which would neutralize the rebels' advantage in numbers. And so with a time of factor, the rebels had to take the city by storm, or not at all. So imagine being a minor lord of the Vale, called to battle against the mighty House Targaryen. You know your history, and you know what happened to the Blackfire pretenders when they thought they could rebel. Any rational lord would worry about the future, and then you see Robert Baratheon is the first man on the walls, slaying Mark Grafton in a duel. Lord Arryn was well over 60 and was astride his warhorse leading his troops. What an unbelievable sight that must have been to those doubting lords. Right. Remember, Ares had made his last public appearance years ago, and he had the mane of a beggar with his tangled hair, disgusting fingernails, and unstable outbursts. Robert was every inch the warrior, and it inspired his troops. As we hear Lord Borel state to Davos, he fights the way a king should fight. So from a morale perspective, this gave the rebels a huge boost of certainty, right? This wouldn't be the disaster at Duskendale. These rebels were serious. And when the news reached them about Robert and Eddard escaping the Vale and returning to their ancestral holds, to surround themselves with their own bannermen, it would raise morale even further. Combined, the North, the Vale and the Stormlands could field a mighty host, one large enough to threaten the walls of King's Landing, and should they close the alliance with the Riverlands, they would have roughly half the country on their side, a greater force than any of these unsuccessful rebels had in generations past. But Ares was not about to take this failure lying down. When Robert escaped back to his own lands to raise troops and further trouble the Targaryen regime, Ares grew angry at his hand's failure to prosecute the war and suspected him of disloyalty. He dismissed Owen Merriweather and exiled him from Westeros with his entire family and appointed a new, more vigorous hand, John Connington of Griffin's Roost. This itself is a fascinating choice with severe political implications. Connington was certainly a close friend of Rhaegar's. There was no question of conflicting loyalty to Robert, and as a Stormlander, Ares could show that Robert didn't command loyalty over every Stormlord, to prevent others from perceiving a bandwagon effect. However, there was a flip side, in that in the time before Robert's rebellion, Ares was quite suspicious of Rhaegar's own faction, and in naming a devoted Rhaegar loyalist, he risked giving a previous rival faction the power of the kingdom behind him. 
This means that Ares must have considered Rhaegar less of a threat than Robert's faction for sure, or that Rhaegar couldn't realistically oppose him with Robert active on the field. And so Ares would focus the fight against Robert every step of the way. True. And Eddard's journey was no less dangerous. When he came ashore at Sweet Sister, he came face to face with Lord Godric Borel. And Lord Godric mentioned that the Targaryens were looking for him, and he could be richly rewarded if he turned him over to Ares. Eddard, showing remarkable political astuteness, pointed out that if the rebels won, then it's bad for the cautious Lord of Sisterton. But conversely, if Eddard was never there, then Lord Borel would be safe, no matter which way the war went. Summerhall. Okay, so after the dramatic victory at Gulltown, Robert was able to sail to Storm's End and go to work calling his banners. Yet Robert's command over the Stormlander's loyalty wasn't absolute, even without the promise of high appointments like the case of John Connington. Much like John Arryn and Lord Grafton, Robert found his own lords rising against him. Lords Grandison, Fell, and Caffarin all elected to throw in their hats with House Targaryen and marshalled their armies to attack Robert, planning to meet at the Targaryen Palace of Summerhall to combine their forces. And Robert, learning of this plan, marched his own armies to Summerhall and crushed the Royalist Stormlanders as they arrived, one right after the other. He slew... Lord Fell in single combat, and captured Lords Caffarin and Grandison, as well as Lord Fell's son, Silveraxe. Unfortunately, we don't know what the numbers were, but given that Robert faced each one of them individually, it's safe to say that none of the armies were even half of the size of Robert's army. Together, they might have formed a large enough force to give Robert some serious trouble, but individually, they could be scattered and defeated in a few hours. So Robert was truly exceptional here, and you've pointed out that this should be firm evidence of Robert's keen tactical mind to rebut anyone who thinks that Robert was an imbecile. Robert was able to identify the threat, develop a plan to counter it, and execute it flawlessly, using superior mobility and aggressive tactics to defeat his enemy before they were able to launch their own plan. This requires a cerebral understanding of war and positioning, not just swinging the hammer the hardest. By intercepting his enemies, he threw their planning into disarray and this caused their responses to be clumsy and imprecise. And it would be very common for panic to sink in, especially among the unprofessional troops that made up a feudal levy. And what really stands out about this battle is that Robert was able to minimize his own casualties and win over converts. All three of the leaders of the enemy houses ended up joining Robert's army, with their levies following. It's a rare battle where you come out of it with more troops than you started with, but Robert's famous charisma did just that. In feudalism, where so much of the politics is dependent on that personal touch, winning the loyalty of your subordinates is key. These rebel lords could have easily been executed by Robert for disloyalty, but instead, Robert won them over and they fought wholeheartedly for him. Yes, they did. Okay, so here Robert was preserving his strength, feeding off his enemy, and keeping his forces in top fighting condition. The North and the Vale were far away, while Dawn and the Reach were nearby. Losses weren't just setbacks. They had the potential to entrap him far from friendly support. And Robert couldn't just march against the capital either, or he risked exposing himself to the royal army while the reach fell upon his rear. And so, with the march north too risky, Robert elected to march west to strike the heart of his enemy's manpower, the reach. Ashford 
Why Robert elected to attack Ashford Keep isn't mentioned, but taking enemy strongholds is actually a solid stratagem in feudalism. Armies don't just require beef and grain to keep them in top fighting form, they also require horses and blades. By taking castles and the armories within, Robert could improve his own stores of equipment and deny them to his enemy. And there's a political element to it as well. Feudalism works because the overlord promises protection to his subordinates in exchange for military service. If Robert takes castles with impunity and the Reach fails to respond, the Tyrell vassals might become scared and disloyal. Any one of them could be the next one to lose their lordly seat, and perhaps even their families could be in jeopardy. If they deserted to their homes, they could protect themselves from Robert's advance. Or even better, Robert might pass them by, sparing them from any sort of risk. In that sense, Striking West appeared to be a strategic plan to undermine the Tyrell army from within, cause desertion, and get the Tyrells to abandon the Targaryen cause. But Randall Tarly had other ideas, didn't he? He force-marched his van and attacked Robert at Ashford Keep before Robert could put that strategy into motion. Much like the Battles of Summerhall, there's little information in the text about the Battle of Ashford as to the tactical formation as it happened. All we really know are the results. Randall Tarly was able to defeat Robert, though the victory is noted to be inconclusive. Inconclusive enough that we know Robert was able to withdraw in good order and that Randall didn't feel confident enough to pursue though this may be because he didn't elect to advance even further beyond the bulk of Reachman forces led by his superior, Mace Tyrell. We do know that Randall Tarly is an experienced, intelligent general and could easily analyse and assess battlefield risk, so his election not to pursue was likely derived from battlefield judgement and not any standing orders from the Tyrells, or Tarly would have likely smouldered at bad orders costing him the war. Well, suffice to say, this was an incredible morale boost to House Targaryen, as the rebels at this point seemed to be able to move with invincible momentum. But at Ashford, Randall Tarly slew Lord Caffarin, that one-time loyalist who joined Robert after Summerhall. When Tarly sent Caffarin's head to Ares, the capital received physical proof that victory was not impossible, and King Ares could demonstrate tangibly that treason would be punished in the harshest possible way. Caffarin's head was proof of power for the Targaryen regime, and a promise that the war would not be over quickly. Storm's End And now, with Robert withdrawing north, the heart of the Stormlands was laid open to the Tyrell army. John Connington had taken over the pursuit of Robert as he went north towards the Riverlands, and Mace Tyrell elected to march east towards Robert's ancestral holding, defended by his younger brother Stannis. Robert's ancient home had never in its history fallen to invasion or storm, and it was a tempting prize for Mace to conquer the unconquerable at Storm's End. If he pursued Robert, he risked sharing glory with John Connington, or horror of horrors, getting defeated, while a siege could be maintained for as long as Mace had the time. A safe choice, but also a deeply political one, the fat flower looking to enrich himself with the minimum of effort. And the siege itself is a testament to Stannis' leadership, even at that young age, and is an oft-overlooked feat in his admittedly spectacular military career. Sieges are both physically and psychologically taxing affairs for the defender. When supplies dwindle, rationing means that each soldier is in a physically weakened state, and as time stretches on and stressors continue to pile on, each soldier becomes anxious and agitated. To Stannis' unbelievable credit, there was only one instance of attempted treason which was quickly discovered and handled. This in itself was unusual, as many sieges ended with a bribed gate guard or a gate left open in exchange for safe treatment. But the Baratheon soldiers at Storm's End were stern enough to wait for their lord and faithful enough not to betray his brother. 
Yeah, interestingly, the ability to inspire people and unite them behind a single purpose is one of Robert and Stannis's few shared character traits. Stannis's own dour ruminations of his unpopularity notwithstanding. For all that Stannis moans about how no one ever likes him, he's inspiring enough to have his men cross a bridge of fiery wreckage at Blackwater and his men follow him to battle against hopeless odds north of the Wall. Despite their differences, Robert and Stannis were similar in a lot of ways too. Both were unafraid of being in the mud with their subordinates, both never forgot their promises come what may, and both were fiercely brave and stubborn, and those traits were discerned and understood by their men, and that in turn fostered fierce loyalty. Well, this unity of purpose was undoubtedly one of the reasons for the success of this war. John Aaron, Eddard Stark, Robert and Stannis, every single field commander shared a singular goal. And this is tremendous when it comes to an army from the top echelons. A single, unified goal, clearly communicated and striven for, is a galvanizing force. Whereas disparate objectives, especially ones that aren't sincere, can invite suspicion among rival factions, disagreement as to the strategic objectives of a campaign, and politicking that leads to suboptimal deployment. Whether it was Robert's battlefield heroism, Stannis's unswerving dedication to his cause, or Eddard's unstoppable march, every general knew the goal, and none slacked in pursuing it. The Battle of the Bells and now we come to Stony Sept. While Stannis was starving, Roberts was faring little better. John Connington was in hot pursuit, hoping to strike and slay Robert and end the rebellion once and for all, while Robert was looking to hold on to his army long enough to meet up with his allies who were marching south to meet him. The Riverlands were under the control of Hoster Tully and they had not been idle in the war, pacifying Goodbrook when they elected to fight for the Targaryens, but in the wars of Westeros past, the Riverlands had suffered from divided loyalties and the Tullys were bound to the rebels by a mere betrothal, which wasn't as firm an alliance as a marriage to rely upon in an emergency. Robert's firm friends... John Arryn and Eddard Stark were much further away, separated by mountains and rivers. So when this pursuit came too close, Robert took refuge in Stony Sept as John Connington closed in on the town, surrounding it and attempting to ferret out Robert's location. And at this point, we're at the nodder of morale for the rebellion where before they were riding high and almost invincible juggernauts scattering loyalists left and right. But now they're deer, fleeing from the wolf, or the griffin in this case, hiding and scurrying from hiding place to hiding place. Their invincible warrior leader is wounded, their enemies are everywhere, and their friends are distant. It's almost enough to cause someone to lose heart. But Robert kept them united, kept them focused and knew that all he needed was time. But time was in short supply for John Connington. He was on hostile Rivlander soil, and he knew that his enemies wouldn't wait while he sought one of the most senior rebel leaders. Eddard Stark and Dennis Arryn were marching south to meet him, so he had to smoke out whatever safe house Robert was in before it was too late. Connington attempted to use every tool he could at his disposal to get the people of Stony Sept to turn Robert over, and as Hand of the King, what he could offer would be a great deal. So first, Connington looked to use the carrot, offering gold to any residents of Stony Sept that could give Robert up. But when they refused, he took out the stick, and stuck villagers in crow cages. None of it could shake Robert Baratheon from his hiding place, and before Connington could find his quarry, he received word of a coming threat. Enemies on the horizon, flying wolf and falcon and trout. 
so the emotions going through these soldiers' heads must have been the most powerful ones they'd ever experienced in their lives. No matter what army you were fighting under, this day would be the most intense one you'd ever experience. A soldier under Eddard Stark, already days on a long march, moving as quickly as possible in an attempt to rescue Robert from the Royalists. It would have been a long, weary march, with uncertainty whether it could all be for naught. Then, Stony Sept comes into view, and the war horns blare, and the army charges. Or a frantic royalist soldier, searching from house to house, feeling his frustration turn to horror when the word goes up that the rebels are within view, charging the town. Or even more climactic, a soldier next to his recovering leader, tired and fearful as the Stormlanders move between safe houses. And then the surge of elation as war cries of Stark and For Robert surge through the town. And then Robert grabs his warhammer and marches forth to battle, slaying Sir Miles Mooton. All of that fear would turn to joy. You're possibly at the very end of the line one moment, making peace with your upcoming doom. And a rope of life drops in front of you and your lord grabs it and shows that fury and prowess that he had shown at the very beginning of the campaign, when he appeared invincible and all things were possible. Conversely, the royalists are swallowing the bitterest of all pills. They had Robert in their grasp. They were so close to ending the rebellion and being the great heroes of the Targaryen cause. And it just slipped through their fingers, and they were left with nothing. And above it all, those bells which gave the battle its name, ringing in the sept to warn the citizens to stay inside. Everything was at a fever pitch, made heavier by those clanging bells. As John Connington would later recall, seventeen years had come and gone since the Battle of the Bells, yet the sound of bells ringing still tied a knot guts so th- this battle is really the turning point of the rebellion well george and others view the trident as the true climax of the war this battle provides much of the nuts and bolts needed for robert's successful overall victory robert was now linked up with the combined armies of the vale and the north The Tullys also took the field and even shed blood for the cause, with Hosta being wounded at the battle. The double marriage tying the Starks and Arryns to the Tullys resulted, cementing the Riverlands to the cause. Once the armies of the four rebel lords could combine together, they'd have a force large enough to threaten King's Landing itself. And with John Connington in disgrace and banished, Ares would turn to his son, Rhaegar, to command the royal army. The Battle of the Trident They had come together at the ford of the Trident while the battle crashed around them. Robert with his warhammer and his great antlered helm, the Targaryen prince armored all in black. On his breastplate was the three-headed dragon of his house, wrought all in rubies that flashed like fire in the sunlight. The waters of the trident ran red around the hooves of their destriers as they circled and clashed again and again, until at last a crushing blow from Robert's hammer stove in the dragon and the chest beneath it. When Ned had finally come on the scene, Rhaegar lay dead in the stream, while men of both armies scrabbled in the swirling waters for rubies not free of his army. Leading up to their meeting at the Trident, the two sides had finally amassed their power for one decisive showdown. The armies of the North and the Vale had finally marched out from their remote regions to join with the Riverlands and the Stormlands into a 35,000-strong host. 
miles away in the capital, Prince Rhaegar had marched back to King's Landing with an army of 10,000 Dornishmen, combined it with the army formerly under the command of John Connington, and reinforced it with men from the Reach into one large force some 40,000 strong. The rebels had achieved enough strategic victories that now the objective was to take King's Landing, depose Ares, and install Robert in his place. The Royalists, too, had a clear objective. United behind Rhaegar, they had all four of the senior rebel commanders in one place, and they needed to reverse their momentum and decisively re-establish their control within the region. The two armies marched forward until they came together at the low crossing of the Trident, a ford along the King's Road. Destiny was at hand. That's right, the two sides were led by the most prominent nobles of the era. Robert led the van opposite Rhaegar. John Arryn commanded his Knights of the Vale against the Dornish Spearmen, led by Lewin Martell. Eddard Stark's unit fought Barristan Selmes, and Hoster Tully faced Jonathor Darry. The battle was chaos, a whirlwind of dust and steel, easily one of the largest battles of its time. 75,000 people locked in mortal combat, different coloured banners flapping, the din of steel and screams would be so loud that it would be almost maddening. And Robert and Rhaegar found themselves together in the low water of the ford. On one side was the charismatic rebel lord, thought of as the laughing storm reborn. On the other, the awe-inspiring crown prince, who hearkened back to the glory days of Targaryen excellence. Even as combat raged around them, as the storied legends of the Kingsguard fell to rebel swords, Robert and Rhaegar squared off in the center of the river. Yeah, Robert in his youth was a colossus of combat ability. He was tall, well-muscled, and a practiced fighter, the champion of many a tawny melee, and having slain two nobles in single combat, along with countless other men during the course of the war, with a fire in his stomach that came from the culmination of his frustration with the crown prince. Rhaegar was a skilled swordsman and jouster, excelling in this as he had in many of his other pursuits. Yet all of Rhaegar's technique availed him little against Robert. Despite popular caricatures, Robert was not pure boundless strength that overpowered finer skill. Robert had received a noble's education from John Arryn, which would include many hours spent in the training yard, and was skilled in both the physical and cerebral spheres of combat. Rhaegar was actually able to put up a great fight, even severely wounding Robert, but Robert's skill and strength in the end won him the day, and once he caved in Rhaegar's breastplate, it was all over, for him and his dynasty both. Yeah, for the common royalist soldier, this was the final breaking point. The finest swords in all of Westeros, the King's Guard, each led component armies, with the Crown Prince himself, half a god in his splendid black armor, at the head of the largest army seen in this war to date. The rebels were coming for the capital, and this was the chance to stop their advance, to break their unified army. And the prince falls, rubies splashing in the water as they fling free from Robert's monstrous impact. The prince can barely try to pull himself to his feet before that terrible hammer comes again, almost howling its way through the air until it lands with a sickening thud. A sound that is not metal striking metal, but metal striking the man underneath. So in contrast, the rebel soldiers must have been thinking of this as nothing short of a sign of absolute, almost divine victory. The rebels had been close to death and rebounded, and now stood amidst a host that was greater than it had ever been before. All across the battlefield, there had been minor victories here and there, but one by one, the enemy standards fell. 
Louis Martel's Sun and Spear, the pure white banner of the Kingsguard, and then Robert Baratheon slew Rhaegar and proved the righteousness of his cause. What giddy elation must have been felt from men who were tired, sore, perhaps even wounded in combat, to see that once and for all, they were going to win this war. And almost as strategically critical as the loss of Rhaegar was the loss of three of the Kingsguard. Prince Lewin Martell was slain by Lynn Corbray, wielding his father's Valyrian steel blade. And Jonathor Derry was also killed, cut down by an anonymous person whose name is lost to history. Barristan Selmy survived, but he was critically wounded and in Eddard Stark's custody, with Gerald Hightower, Oswald Went, and the legendary swordsman Arthur Dane, currently MIA. The only general that Ares Targaryen had left was young Jaime Lannister, whom he had been keeping close at hand as a safeguard against Lord Tywin joining the rebels. King Ares had burned his political capital the way he burned men for disobeying him, and now few were willing to take the royalist side in their hour of desperate need. The way lay open for Robert and his rebels to march into the capital and seize the king, Prince Viserys, Queen Rhaella, and Rhaegar's children, the only Targaryens left. Doing so would make Robert's ascension unopposed, as no other claimant conceivably existed. With only the gold cloaks and the walls of the city standing in his way, the writing was on the wall. The Battle of the Mander In the meantime, Balon Greyjoy, heir to Quellen, not one to miss an opportunity to try and get rich quick, urged his father to strike against Robert's enemies on the west coast. Robert's victory was self-assured, and Balon argued that to neglect action now would be to lose a chance to share in the spoils, or worse, to potentially be branded as royalists and lose holdings and power that they had enjoyed under King Ares and the Targaryen dynasty. This thinking wasn't exactly outlandish, it does make sense. Robert was now fully in his power and no longer needed to court the support of neutral parties to gain the strength needed to push his coalition to victory. Those who sided with him before this point would expect rich rewards, and in a feudal system where land is power, that land had to come from someone. And in the end... Balin's logic won out, and Quellen Greyjoy, now aging, sent out with a scant 50 longship to attack Reach Holdings along the Sunset Sea. Most of Quellen's ironmen and fleet remained at home to guard against any possible aggression by the Lannisters, and the conflict was small scale, with less than 3,000 men, as opposed to the Westeros wide engagement that tried it earlier. A few villages were raided, a few ships were sunk or captured, and the only battle of note was at the mouth of the Mander where the Shield Islands, the traditional naval bulwark against the Ironborn, engaged the Greyjoy fleet. The losses on both sides were minor, with a combined 12 ships being sunk between the two parties. Yes, significantly, the only casualty we're given a name for was the aging Quellon himself, and his loss had great political implications. Quellon was one of the Iron Islands' most radical reformers, and his reforms were aimed at strengthening the bonds between the Iron Islands and the mainland. He encouraged marriages between Ironborn and mainlanders, brought maesters and the promotion of literacy, medicine and education, forbade most reaving, freed the thralls from bondage, and heavily taxed the taking of salt wives. Balon, a devoted follower of the old way, would reverse his father's decrees and dream of a day when Westeros was not an overlord, but a target. The Manda was a small engagement, but it would have a big impact on the future of Westeros. The Sack of King's Landing And now Tywin Lannister, too, had been stirred to action. The shrewd and cunning Lord Tywin had long been silent during the rebellion, ignoring entreaties from rebel and royalist alike. He had marshaled his banners, 
but had refused to declare for one side or the other, preferring instead to wait until conditions suited him before he entered the war. At last, with the death of Rhaegar, Tywin Lannister finally selected his side and his opening move. And so, surging ahead of Eddard Stark, who is marching to King's Landing, Tywin Lannister led an army of Westermen, some 12,000 strong, down the Gold Road, sending word that he was coming to reinforce the city and defend his leal king, and he asked that the gates be opened so that his men could take their place on the walls and help to defend the city. Right. King Aerys had a choice there. Open the gates, as asked by Tywin and counseled by Grand Maester Pycelle, or refuse, as counseled by Lord Varys. Much has been made of this choice, and it is often thought of as an easy one. Tywin was untrustworthy, had been frequently insulted in the past, and the rebels were at the cusp of victory. Only a fool would tie his horse to the burning wagon, and Ares should have known that. However, it's not quite so clear-cut, is it? The rebels had 35,000 men at the Trident, and at first glance, Tywin's 12,000 seems like it would only make the final battle bloodier, still a sure thing for the victorious rebels. But in fact, the 12,000 reinforcements to the capital's few thousand defenders would have been a significant game-changer for the embattled royalists. With King's Landing open to naval resupply from Essos via the Royal Fleet, the rebels were forced to attack the city, and Tywin's Westermen would have meant putting the rebels well below the desired 3 to 1 ratio for an attacker, even if the rebels hadn't lost a single man at the Trident. That's right, and the initial attack would have been led by Eddard Stark at the head of the rebel vanguard, with much of their army still recovering on the Trident. The high walls of the capital, and enough men to man them in shifts, would mean well-rested, well-fortified troops able to repulse ladders, launch postern sorties and night raids, and continually resupply themselves with coin from both Casterly Rock and the Royal Treasury. Once Storm's End fell, the Reach would march north, and then the manpower advantage would belong to the Royalists. Conversely, if Ares refused to open the gate, he would be demanding that Tywin win his war without royal support. And without the walls of the city, Tywin is left outnumbered on open soil. That would make an enemy of Tywin and force him into the rebel camp, possibly out of pure survival. And the rebels would then have an overwhelming advantage to take the city by storm. So King Ares was left with two moves. One had a chance to save him, the other doomed him inevitably. Well, perhaps Ares was no longer rational. Perhaps he wanted his old glory days when all was possible and doom didn't weigh upon him. Or even more sinisterly, perhaps he wanted to ensure his hated enemy would see his glorious draconic apotheosis as his last vision before perishing in flame. We'll never know. King Ares ordered the gates opened, and Tywin went to work at once, sacking the city in Robert's name. Tywin had, at last, declared himself openly as a rebel. And the carnage was visible to Eddard Stark, who had taken over the command of the rebel host while Robert lay recuperating from the wounds in his fateful duel with Rhaegar. He had expected to find a defiant city that he would need to take, or perhaps he had hoped that the city would open the gates for him so he would need only lay siege to the Red Keep itself, sparing the citizens the horror of a sack. Yet instead he found a bloody massacre and red banners with a gold lion over the walls. And it was even worse when he came into the throne room and saw Jaime Lannister, that smiling youth perched upon the Iron Throne itself, bloody sword in hand, the dead body of King Ares at the foot of that massive hulk. To Eddard, this looked like nothing short of a Lannister coup, one that he only averted by having his army arrive at that time. Jaime Lannister, one of the sworn Kingsguard, murdered his king and had the gall to laugh about it and sit on the Iron Throne, a place that he had no business being. Then, 
the bodies of Elia Martel and her two young children were brought into the throne room, draped in red cloaks, each slain more savagely than the last, and it was held up as a token of fealty for the new King Robert. And when Robert arrived later, Eddard roundly called for these actions to be punished, and Robert refused. The two argued fiercely, and their friendship rested on a razor's edge at this point. Eventually, Robert ordered Eddard to relieve Stannis at Storm's End, and the Lord of Winterfell left the capital in a cold rage. Surrender at Storm's End and the Tower of Joy. So Stannis had been holding Storm's End from the hands of the Reach since before the Battle of the Bells, and had long since exhausted the traditional food supplies of Storm's End, even consuming the castle vermin. But still, he had refused to surrender. Yet Stannis' patience and Davos Seaworth's excellent seamanship were rewarded when Eddard Stark rode south and accepted Mace Tyrell's surrender, lifting the siege with not a single drop of blood shed. His king was dead, there was no reason to continue fighting, so Mace accepted defeat. Stannis had been rescued, but there were still other rebel family members missing. That's right, Lyanna Stark, the woman whose disappearance became the flashpoint of Robert's rebellion, was still missing. However Eddard might have found out, he learned that she was at an old watchtower in the Red Mountains of Dawn, in a hideaway we later learn Rhaegar called the Tower of Joy. Eddard's seven men faced three Kingsguard, and in the end, Eddard returned, bringing someone in tow. But it wasn't his sister, who perished from an as-yet-unconfirmed cause some time after her brother reached her side. Ultimately, the rescue of Lyanna Stark was a failure. Both Eddard and Robert shared in this grief, which brought the two back together in friendship. Robert married Cersei Lannister while Eddard returned home to his new wife and infant son, bringing Jon Snow along with him. Both men would sit their seats with a permanent hole in their hearts. So that brings us to the end of the rebellion itself. Up next, we're going to consider the aftermath, including Stannis' assault on Dragonstone, the position of the Great Houses following the conflict, and the course of Robert's reign. But before we go, we must say thank you, a huge thank you, to Jim for joining us today. We really appreciate your contributions to Radio Westeros today, and we really enjoyed working you on this fantastic topic. Uh, well, I was happy to, to be here with uh, you and Lady Gwyn. I love your show, and it's always great to talk about uh, circles and squares uh, in A Song of Ice and Fire. Thanks for having me on. Okay, and listeners, be sure to check out Jim's essays. He posts as something like a lawyer at the Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog. And we especially recommend his series on the Targaryen kings and his contribution to the Tower of the Hand ebook called A Hymn for Spring. And he's done a nice piece on Robert's Rebellion in there. So check that one out. And I'll be back in just a moment with Lady Gwyn to discuss the state of Westeros in the aftermath of the final conflicts. Hey, sirs and ladies, I'm Scad. I'm Brooke. And I'm Matt. And we are the Davos Fingers. The Davos Fingers podcast is a chapter-by-chapter analysis of the Song and Ice and Fire series. Our MO is to keep it fun yet insightful, but we do like to go deep. That's what she said. While still maintaining a healthy dose of f***ing irreverence. <laughs> yep, just three friends discussing what we love best. Oh yeah, and we're spoiler-free, except for a no-holds-barred, anything-goes discussion at the end of each cast called Davos After Dark. Plus a plethora of references to other geeky things we love, and jokes you last heard in middle school. So whether you're a first-time reader, or on your 15th reread, come hang with Davos Fingers. Listen at DavosFingers.com or on iTunes. Davos Fingers, it's like a book club with your friends. But not lame! Nailed it!
I saw King's Landing after the sack. Babes were butchered that day as well, and old men, and children at play. More women were raped than you can count. And we're back now to discuss the aftermath of the rebellion. With Robert seated on the Iron Throne, there still remained a few loose ends to wrap up before victory could be complete. We mentioned a couple in our last segment, with Ned marching south and achieving the surrender of Mace Tyrell and his forces in Vesting Storm's End, and then racing into the Red Mountains of Dorne to find his sister, where the resulting conflict left five Northmen and three of Ares' Kingsguard dead. And during that confrontation, according to Ned's dream memory of the event, we learned that Ned questioned why Dane, Went, and Hightower hadn't gone to join the surviving Targaryens on Dragonstone. Sir Willem Darius fled to Dragonstone with your queen and Prince Viserys. I thought you might have sailed with him. Sir Willem is a good man and true, said Sir Oswell. But not of the King's Guard, Sir Gerald pointed out. The King's Guard does not flee. And while fans have debated the meaning of that exchange for years, we're going to focus on the flight to Dragonstone. For, with his eldest son dead and the rebel army bearing down upon the capital, Ares sent his wife and young son Viserys to Dragonstone for safekeeping. That he kept Elia of Dorne and Rhaegar's children in King's Landing was a tragedy born from his paranoia that Dorne had betrayed him at the Trident. These two decisions would prove particularly momentous to the course of the main story, as the deaths of Elia and her children created a focal point for revenge against the Lannisters, and, of course, the survival of Viserys and Rhaella, who, unbeknownst to Ares at the time, was pregnant, led to the birth of a daughter who would grow up to become one of the main characters in A Song of Ice and Fire. So Daenerys owes her very existence to an apparently lucid decision made by her paranoid father, whose grip on reality at that point could be described as tentative or even non-existent. As with Ares' call for Robert's head, we have to wonder if there was someone whispering in his ear in this case. Could Varys have seen a possible use for Viserys as early as that? While his plotting may have only been in its infancy, we wouldn't be surprised if the notorious spymaster had at least some germ of a notion that the young Targaryen prince could be useful to him one day. Hmm. At any rate, following the liberation of Storm's End, Stannis Baratheon spent months building a fleet at his brother Robert's command so that control of the Targaryen stronghold at Dragonstone could be wrested from the surviving queen and her supporters. But by the time Stannis was prepared to sail, the queen had died in childbirth, even as a ferocious storm destroyed the Targaryen fleet as it lay in Dragonstone's harbor. Things seemed grim for Viserys and the infant Daenerys, the last survivors of the once mighty Targaryen dynasty. Yeah, the garrison at Dragonstone, trapped as they were, was prepared to surrender to Stannis and turn over the children. But Sir Willem Darry, that good man and true, along with four other loyal men, managed to spirit the two away to the Bravosi coast even as Stannis made ready to sail, setting up the next chapter in Targaryen history, with Viserys and Danny being the objects of the assassins allegedly sent by Robert, as well as apparent secret plots and alliances up through the time we meet them in Danny's 14th year. And for the record, the matter of Dragonstone would have an impact on Robert's later reign as well, since he apparently blamed Stannis for the escape of the Targaryen children. And for Stannis's part, he thinks he only did as his elder brother commanded, and that his reward of being made the Lord of Dragonstone, while the younger brother Renly was given the ancestral Baratheon fortress and overlordship of the Stormlands, was an insult. Cersei tells Tyrion that it was meant to be one, while Maester Crescent thinks, quote, It was an old grievance, deeply felt, and never more so than now. Here was the heart of his lord's weakness. For Dragonstone, old and strong though it was, commanded the allegiance of only a handful of lesser lords, whose stony island holdings were too thinly peopled to yield up the men that Stannis needed. 
Sir Robert, at a stroke, made both of his brothers beholden to him, while creating a rivalry and resentment between them that would eventually have grave repercussions. But what about the other key players from the rebellion? John Arryn, we know, was made Robert's hand. Robert quarrelled with Ned over Rhaegar's dead children, but they were reconciled after Lyanna's death. Nonetheless, Ned returned to Winterfell and mostly kept to himself with his Tully wife for the next 15 years. And speaking of Tullys, Hoster Tully remained in control of the Riverlands and was now the father-in-law of two of his fellow Lords Paramount. Tywin Lannister forged a new alliance with Robert, marrying his daughter Cersei to the new king and apparently finally achieving his dream of seeing his daughter as Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Robert pardoned Jaime Lannister for killing Ares and also made Sir Barristan Selmy his new Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. While the latter appointment is a perfect illustration of Robert's mercy for a defeated foe, his pardon of Jaime Lannister was fairly controversial and of course resulted in Cersei being able to live out her dream of having Jaime close to her in King's Landing so they could carry on their incestuous affair. But for his part, Tywin retreated to Casterly Rock, where he continued to exert influence over the realm through his daughter and through his continued financial support of the royal coffers. We've covered the relationship between Peter Baelish and Liza Tully elsewhere, so here we'll just comment that this was one of many outcomes, foreseen and unforeseen, of the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Yeah, all in all, that earlier conflict, which had so much influence on events leading up to the rebellion, seems to have resulted chiefly in two momentous outcomes for the realm. One was the rise to power of Peter Baelish, who by any measure has had a huge impact on the Seven Kingdoms in the present. The second was the so-called Southern Ambitions plot and its ultimate failure. Because by any measure, while such plotting may have informed the underpinning of the rebellion, the carefully thought out alliances that could have led to a new balance of power in the realm failed in the end. Yeah, that's right. In the New Order, House Lannister would be in the ascendancy, while Jon Arryn, having lost two adult heirs in the rebellion, had an apparently infertile new wife who ultimately did provide him with a sickly boy heir whose control over the airy could never match his father's. House Stark returned to its relative isolationism, and the Riverlands were more or less powerless, balanced as they were between the Westerlands and the Crownlands, and with no position at court. And while Mace Tyrell had been pardoned for his part in the war as a Targaryen supporter, as Robert pardoned most of his one-time opponents, he hadn't been given any position of note in Robert's government and remained in the reach, out of the affairs of the realm. Dawn seems to have completely withdrawn, kept in the realm only by the diplomacy of John Arryn, although we later learn that there were secret negotiations with Targaryen supporters abroad to marry their heir, Princess Ariane, to Prince Viserys Targaryen as part of a plot to gain revenge upon the Lannisters and Baratheons for their roles in the deaths of Princess Elia and her children. And finally, we arrive at the Iron Islands. When the reformer Quellen Greyjoy, who had known Hoster Tully, John Arryn, Tywin Lannister, and Robert's father Stefan in his youth, died at the Battle of the Mander, his son Balon became the Lord Reaper of Pike. And as we mentioned in the last segment, Balon Greyjoy set about reversing many of his father's reforms, seemingly intent upon re-establishing the old way in the Iron Islands. He was, and six years into Robert's reign... Balon had himself crowned King of the Iron Isles in the old way with a driftwood crown by a priest of the Drowned God. It seems that Balon thought that perhaps Robert's hold on power wasn't quite strong enough to successfully defeat a rebellion from the Iron Islands. George commented in a chat with fans that... Balon believed that Robert, as a usurper, might not have the strong support of the other lords the way that a Targaryen king would have. He also thought he could defeat Robert at sea. 
But in spite of an early show of strength, when he burned the Lannister fleet at anchor in Lannisport, Balon's next attempt to attack the mainland failed when Lord Jason Malister threw the Ironborn back into the sea at Seacard, killing Balon's eldest son, Roderick, in the process. And Stannis, now his brother's master of ships, led the Westerosi navy to a decisive victory over the Iron Fleet at sea, while Robert himself led the assault on Pike, where he was accompanied by his old friend Ned Stark and numerous others whom we meet in the main series, people like Jorah Mormont, Thoris of Mere, and Jacelyn Bywater. And when the walls of Pike were breached, Balon's second son Meron was killed. Following the defeat in his very stronghold, Balon was brought before Robert in chains and forced to bend the knee, while his surviving son Theon was given to Ned Stark as a hostage. And we hardly need to point out the consequences of Balon's decade of brooding defeat and Theon's time as hostage ward to Ned Stark would have on the main series, but as an outgrowth of Robert's rebellion, the impact of Balon Greyjoy's rebellion can hardly be understated. Yeah, for sure. Balon's ambitions weren't defeated in the Siege of Pike, and the loss of his sons and the humiliation of the defeat only stoked the fires of his ambition, so that when the time was right in the chaotic aftermath of Robert's death, he was ready to assert himself once again. And we've offered an entire episode on Theon, and we think that his insecurities and the identity crisis caused by the loss of his own family at an early age and a decade with the Starks can be seen as the source for much of his decision-making that we see. Yeah, there's no doubt those experiences moulded Theon into the person we see in the main series. And so, what followed Balon's rebellion can really be seen as a period of increased Lannister power, as Lord Tywin emerged as the crown's primary lender and Cersei used her influence, especially in matters of appointments, to support her family's ascendancy. As Catelyn warns Ned at the beginning of game, Cersei's pride is said to grow with every passing year. And we have no doubt that was because her power did as well. And with Robert increasingly isolated by his own behavior and by the lack of trustworthy people around him at court, it proved an easy thing for Cersei to influence Kingsguard appointments, choose Robert's own squires, and convince her husband that John Arryn's son should become her father's ward. That this plan preceded the death of the Hand is a strong indication that House Lannister was positioning itself to be in a position of even greater strength by neutralizing their one conceivable opponent at court, Robert's foster father, John Arryn. Yeah, and so imagine what a stroke of good fortune it must have seemed to the Lannisters when John Arryn suddenly died following a short illness. And while we ultimately learn that Lord Arryn was poisoned by his own wife, in Clash, Tyrion is able to get Grand Maester Pycelle to confess to failing to save the Hand's life. It's very revealing, so here's the full passage. We think it's definitely worth absorbing this in its entirety. And what was Lord Aaron plotting? He knew, Pycelle said, about... about... I know what he knew about, snapped Tyrion, who was not anxious for Shaga and Timmit to know as well. He was sending his wife back to the Eyrie and his son to be fostered on Dragonstone. He meant to act... So you poisoned him first. No, Pacelle struggled feebly. Shaga growled and grabbed his head. The clansman's hand was so big he could have crushed the maester's skull like an eggshell had he squeezed. Tyrion tisked at him. I saw the tears of Lys among your potions, and you sent away Lord Aaron's own maester and tended him yourself so that you could make certain he died. A falsehood! Shave him closer, Tyrion suggested. The throat again. The axe swept down, rasping over the skin. A thin film of spit bubbled on Pycelle's lips as his mouth trembled. I tried to save Lord Aaron. I vow. Careful now, Shaga. You've cut him. Shaga growled. Dolph-fathered warriors, not barbers. When he felt the blood trickling down his neck and onto his chest, the old man shuddered, and the last strength went out of him. 
He looked shrunken, both smaller and frailer than he had been when they burst in on him. Yes, he whimpered. Yes, Coleman was purging, so I sent him away. The queen needed Lord Aaron dead. She did not say so, could not. Varys was listening, always listening. But when I looked at her, I knew. It was not me who gave the poison, though. I swear it. The old man wept. Varys will tell you. It was the boy, his squire, Hugh, he was called. He must surely have done it. Ask your sister. Ask her. So, a very interesting passage there, because apart from adding to the confusion of who killed John Arryn and why, while at the same time shedding some light on why Sir Hugh of the Vale was such a key figure in solving the mystery, it confirms that there were two counterplots afoot relating to the fostering of young Robert Arryn. Because whoever controlled the heir to the Vale, whether his father was alive or not, would also control, or at least be able to neutralise, the army of the Vale, which of course is no small force. And in that very same scene, Pycelle tells Tyrion that Renly was plotting to bring the Highgarden maid to court to entice his brother indicating that Renly's involvement with the Reach was hardly a new alliance, and that there had probably been a low-level struggle for power going on at court for years, with the lines that emerged following Robert's death fairly well established, with the wild card of House Stark, who many of the players had probably expected to remain in their isolationist position, only coming into play late in the game. Well, Jamie tells Cersei at Winterfell that they should be grateful Robert didn't choose one of his brothers as his hand, saying, Give me honourable enemies rather than ambitious ones, and I'll sleep more easily by night. Besides confirming the power struggle at court, we see there the first hint that Ned's honour might be a handicap at court rather than a benefit. And speaking of Jamie, in the wake of John Arryn's death, Ned soon finds out that Robert has appointed his brother-in-law as Warden of the East. Yeah, Ned expresses his reservations to Robert in the Barrowland, saying, An able and courageous man, no doubt, but his father is Warden of the West, Robert. In time, Sir Jamie will succeed to that honour. No one man should hold both East and West. And the passage goes on to reveal Ned's unspoken concern that, quote, the appointment would put half the armies of the realm into the hands of the Lannisters. What all of this jockeying for power really highlights is Robert's isolation as a ruler. As he himself tells Ned when he arrives at Winterfell to offer him the position of hand, I'm surrounded by flatterers and fools. It can drive a man to madness, Ned. Half of them don't dare tell me the truth, and the other half can't find it. There are nights I wish we had lost at the Trident. And when convincing her husband to take the post, Catelyn challenges him. You say you love Robert like a brother. Would you leave your brother surrounded by Lannisters? And so Ned is drawn into the affairs of the South once again by his friendship with Robert Baratheon. In our next segment, we'll continue to explore the themes of isolation and loneliness as we look at the state of Robert's reign and the realm in the final months of his life. Now it was perfume that clung to him like perfume, and he had a girth to match his height. Ned had last seen the king nine years before during Balon Greyjoy's rebellion, when the stag and the direwolf had joined to end the pretensions of the self-proclaimed king of the Iron Islands. Since the night they had stood side by side in Greyjoy's fallen stronghold, the king had gained at least eight stone. A beard as coarse and black as iron wire covered his jaw to hide his double chin in the sag of the royal jowls, but nothing could hide his stomach or the dark circles under his eyes. Okay, and so far we've looked at Robert Baratheon's formative years, the rebellion itself and its causes, its political aftermath, and on a personal note, how Robert was such a popular leader in wartime that he could turn hardened enemies into friends. Such was his charisma and his aura that after the rebellion, he was surely the most desirable man in the Seven Kingdoms. 
After all, who could forget Ned's memory that Robert was once muscled like a maiden's fantasy? Anyway, the fact he'd led the first ever successful rebellion against the Targaryen dynasty underlines just how popular he was amongst his fellow men. It's not a stretch to say that as he took the throne in 283, Robert Baratheon, with the inherent decisiveness of his campaign, was the most popular man in the Seven Kingdoms. And we should keep this in mind as we now move into the events of the main book some 15 years later. In our last segment, we began to assess how Robert fared when he laid down his warhammer and donned his crown, moving from soldier to king. The theme of isolation was beginning to become evident based on all the clues we can glean about the recent past. And the first time we see Robert in a Game of Thrones is at Winterfell. Following the sudden death of the Hand John Harren, Robert, his Queen Cersei, and their vast entourage had made the long trip to Winterfell to see his old friend Ned Stark. We've mentioned before that early observations from the eyes of Jon Snow of several characters are very insightful, as Jon tends to see things as they are and is very observant, we think. As ever, Jon's thinking here is plain. Here's the quote. The king was a great disappointment to John. His father had talked of him often. The peerless Robert Baratheon, demon of the trident, the fiercest warrior of the realm, a giant among princes. John saw only a fat man, red-faced under his beard, sweating through his silks. He walked like a man half in his cups. Yeah, so Robert has clearly let himself go. This short quote lets us know in no uncertain terms that kingship has changed him in a big way. The demon of the trident is now a drunken, overweight man, and you can understand John's disappointment after hearing so many heroic tales of the trident from Ned, who had last seen Robert nine years ago during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Since then, it says, quote, The king had gained at least eight stone. A beard as coarse and black as iron wire covered his jaw to hide his double chin and the sag of the royal jowls, but nothing could hide his stomach or the dark circles under his eyes. So there's enough hints early on that Robert is a man who thrived on war and is somewhat lost without it, despite having the Iron Throne to sit on. Later on in game, we see that Robert himself is very aware of this, as he tells Ned, More than once I have dreamed of giving up the crown. Take ship for the free cities with my horse and my hammer. Spend my time warring and whoring. That's what I was made for. The sellsword king, how the singers would love me. Yeah, a better soldier than king is an emerging theme, and given Robert fought so hard to win the throne and overthrow the Targaryens, he seems like quite a tortured soul, and there's a faint tragedy in his predicament. And speaking of tragedy, take his feelings for Lyanna Stark, his deceased betrothed. She was such a huge part of why he got pulled into the rebellion in the first place, and immediately after arriving at Winterfell, Robert asks to see Lyanna's tomb. Given the king has left the queen waiting, the reader can sense that not only might Lyanna's memory be an unhealthy part of Robert's psyche, but also that relations and mutual respect between the king and queen might be lacking. And in the crypts, we get the strong sense that Robert still loves Lyanna after all these years. He seems haunted by her memory as the love he lost. He says, The king touched her cheek. His fingers brushed across the rough stone as gently as if it were living flesh. I vowed to kill Rhaegar for what he did to her. You did? Ned reminded him. Only once, Robert said bitterly. So, revenge clearly did not satisfy Robert, and the way he strokes the statue as if it were alive shows the longing in him. Something obsessional is there about his feelings for Lyanna, compounded later in game when Cersei tells Ned the story of their wedding night. The night of our wedding feast, the first time we shared a bed, he called me by your sister's name. He was on top of me, 
in me, stinking of wine, and he whispered, Lyanna. And the reader is left to wonder if Robert truly loved Lyanna in the way he thought he did, or if he's kind of fallen for an ideal, the great unattainable. Remember that Robert is a serial womanizer, and that Lyanna herself doubted he would stay faithful in their wedding bed. When Brienne tells Jamie that Robert fought the rebellion for love, Jamie, who's also very perceptive, replies that Robert in fact fought for pride, a cunt, and a pretty face. So, if Robert had wed Lyanna, would it have been as perfect and flawless as he might be imagining? Or has Robert slipped into an obsession about something he coveted but can never have? Either way, there's no doubting Lyanna's death continues to affect King Robert in a big way, and we get various windows into this torment throughout A Game of Thrones. Yeah, and this torment speaks to a loneliness in Robert, as we'll discuss further. But in the crypts, we also see the contrast between Ned and Robert. Robert talks of the differing climate and way of life in the South, the opportunities of infidelities with young girls, And all this seems very much at odds with the icy, honourable and serious Ned. The pair are often referred to as being like brothers, but the truth is that they are friends who have a lot of differences and who have spent a long time apart. As Kat tells Ned, the king is a stranger to you. And of course, that must work both ways. Despite this, Robert still considers Ned as a great friend and offers him the handship. And later on in the Barrowlands, Ned and Robert talk. Robert suggests travelling like knights and finding tavern wenches, which contrasts with Ned's reply that, We have duties now, my liege, to the realm, to our children, I to my lady wife, and you to your queen. We are not the boys we were. And when the subject of Daenerys comes up, this growing contrast begins to reveal a conflict. Ned wouldn't hurt a child, and Robert wants the young Targaryen dead. His hate for the Targaryens is something which Ned refers to as a madness in him. Ned recalls how angry he had been when the Targaryen children had been killed at the sack of King's Landing, naming it murder. Robert had called it war. So it's clear that these two so-called brothers, in fact not only have cultural contrasts, but they have deep-rooted ideological differences that will see them clash again. The sad part for Robert is that Ned is the only person he can trust in the Seven Kingdoms, and after travelling half the country to employ him, Ned is perhaps the only person he can call a true friend. Does this sound like the man who led and won a rebellion largely through leadership qualities, charisma and popularity? No, it does not. And set against the honourable and considerate Ned, already Robert is starting to look like someone whose personal habits take precedence over his governance. Ned's a great foil for the capricious king in a literary sense and exposes numerous contradictions in Robert's outlook. When Ned suggested that giving the office of Warden of the East to Jamie Lannister would give the Lannisters too much power, Robert replied, I will fight that battle when the enemy appears on the field. And this from a king who has just admitted to wanting to kill a young female exile for fear that she or her son would one day be allowed to take the field. Yes, that is some blatant hypocrisy from Robert. And in spite of Ned's mistrust of Jamie, the man he found sitting idly and perhaps rather comfortably on Robert's throne, the king shares no such suspicions. By this time, the reader is piecing together the fact that Jamie has been sleeping with Robert's wife and queen, Cersei, for many years now, and is the father of their children. Robert is in the middle of a house of cards and he doesn't even know it, seemingly more concerned with wine, women and song. As Littlefinger later says, Our good Robert is practised at closing his eyes to things he would rather not see. 
Hmm, unfortunately for the realm, though, Robert's selective vision extends far beyond the people around him. During a small council meeting, who, by the way, seemed to do his ruling for him, usually in his absence, Ned makes the shocking discovery that the crown is in massive debt. Here's the passage. You know as well as I that the treasury has been empty for years. I shall have to borrow the money. No doubt the Lannisters will be accommodating. We owe Lord Tywin some three million dragons at present. What matter another hundred thousand? Ned was stunned. Are you claiming that the crown is three million gold pieces in debt? The crown is more than six million gold pieces in debt, Lord Stark. The Lannisters are the biggest part of it, but we've also borrowed from Lord Tyrell, the Iron Bank of Bravos, and several Tyrashi trading cartels. Of late, I've had to turn to the faith. The High Septon haggles worse than a Dornish fishmonger. Ned was aghast. Aerys Targaryen left a treasury flowing with gold. How could you let this happen? Littlefinger gave a shrug. The master of coin finds the money. The king in the hand spend it. I will not believe that John Arryn allowed Robert to beggar the realm, Ned said hotly. Grand Maester Pycelle shook his great bald head, his chains clinking softly. Lord Arryn was a prudent man, but I fear his grace does not always listen to wise counsel. So, Robert, a prodigious spender, according to Littlefinger, has apparently beggared the realm, so this is very, very serious. Whether this was all Robert's spending, or whether Littlefinger has been on the swindle, it really makes no matter from a leadership point of view. King Robert took his eyes off the purse, and that could have a dramatic effect on King's Landing, beyond the bread riots and so on, as winter approaches and the city is financially bust. And one of Robert's many extravagances is the tourney of the hand, which was huge in scale and where large purses were offered to the victors. Predictably, Robert gets drunk, and we see him try and don armor, which he's too fat for. We also see how he treats his wife, here in this passage. No, he thundered in a voice that drowned out all other speech. Sansa was shocked to see the king on his feet, red of face and reeling. He had a goblet of wine in one hand, and he was drunk as a man could be. You do not tell me what to do, woman, he screamed at Queen Cersei. I am king here, do you understand? I rule here, and if I say that I will fight tomorrow, I will fight. Yeah, there's not a lot of respect there, given that their infidelities do go both ways, it's clear Robert and Cersei have no real love between them. We find out in Feast from Maggie the Frog that Robert has fathered a staggering 16 bastards, underlining how promiscuous Robert actually was. And also in Feast, we get an account of his cheating. On a visit to Estermont, Robert would sneak off to bed his own cousin, a voluptuous girl he had known from youth. Cersei had Jamie follow him to discover the truth, and then declared to her brother, I want him horned. And this association between Robert and horns is interesting. He's called the Horned God by Ned for his antlered warhelm, resembling the sigil of his house, and then remember how Robert dies. He's gored by a boar. When Cersei talks of wanting him horned, it's a medieval phrase meaning cuckolded or cheated on by a wife. So George might be playing on that theme when he has Robert literally horned to death in the end. Anyway, Cersei is obviously no faithful spouse, but in Feast we do get more insight into what it was like to be Robert's wife. Yeah, it seems that he was sexually aggressive in the bedroom after his nights of drinking. Cersei calls their interactions assaults. He was always sorry and he blamed the wine and drunkenness when she told him about how much he'd hurt her in the night and said he had no memory of these events. Cersei, however, did not believe him. She thinks the rest had all been lies though. He did remember what he did to her at night. She was convinced of that. She could see it in his eyes. 
He only pretended to forget. It was easier to do that than to face his shame. Deep down, Robert Baratheon was a coward. Hmm. And we also see Robert hit Cersei hard in Game of Thrones. And we hear another story of her hitting him with a cup sometime earlier. There's the bastards on either side and the strong wine plot. And Cersei reveals to Ned in A Game of Thrones that she once had a secret abortion. Altogether, I think we can call this one a seriously dysfunctional marriage. Whether there was one person in the right or wrong at any one time in any of this, we'll leave for you to decide. But the takeaway is that Robert didn't have a friend in his wife. He couldn't trust her, he couldn't depend on her, and he was not loved by her. And in the opinion of Cersei, quote, the wrong man came back from the trident, showing us that Cersei still harbored feelings for Rhaegar and bringing in a parallel with Robert's longing for Lyanna. Yeah, definitely an interesting parallel going on there. And furthermore, we should look at Robert's relationship with his quote unquote children. There's not really much to go on, especially with Tommen and Mycella giving us the sense that Robert wasn't the most attentive of fathers in all probability, but there are some points about Joffrey. He shows flashes of deep-seated reservations about the boy to Ned. Here's a quote. The thought of Joffrey on the throne, with Cersei standing behind him, whispering in his ear, My son! How could I have made a son like that, Ned? And then later on, It would not trouble me if the boy was wild, Ned. You don't know him as I do. Hmm. And we get some insight into what Robert meant by that later on in Storm when Stannis tells us this story. Joffrey, I remember once, this kitchen cat. The cooks were wont to feed her scraps and fish heads. One told the boy that she had kittens in her belly, thinking he might want one. Joffrey opened up the poor thing with a dagger to see if it were true. When he found the kittens, he brought them to show his father. Robert hit the boy so hard I thought he'd killed him. So, familial dysfunction once again there. And here what we're trying to do is just paint a picture and show all the people whom Robert should have loved and been loved by to outline how isolated this admittedly flawed man had become. And the lack of love in Robert's family life extended beyond his wife and children. Here's what Jamie says about Robert's relationship with his brothers. Robert can barely stomach his brothers. Not that I blame him. Stannis would be enough to give anyone indigestion. And then later, when Ned tries to convince him to name Stannis as Warden of the East, it says, The king frowned and said nothing. He looked uncomfortable. Yeah, not much brotherly love between the Baratheons, and that's no doubt why he sees Ned in a brotherly light. After watching his mother and father die, with a wife who hates him, and with the definition of a dysfunctional family life, brothers he can barely stomach, and with a kingdom to rule from an uncomfortable throne, Robert Baratheon cuts an extremely lonesome and isolated figure indeed. Furthermore, Varys highlights to Ned regarding the plot to kill Robert at the melee of the Hand's tourney, that not only does his wife dislike him, but there's no love from the king's guard or the others around him either. Sir Barristan loves his honor, Grand Maester Pycelle loves his office, and Littlefinger loves Littlefinger. The king's guard? A paper shield, the eunuch said. So altogether, we can really see why Robert's relationship with Ned is so important. And George really plays with the fact that Robert has changed a lot with Ned desperately seeking kind of the old Robert to return from deep within this tortured, drunken soul. When Ned is investigating Lannister's involvement in the plot to murder Bran, he thinks, I pray that he is the man I think he is, and not the man I fear he has become. 
And later Ned thinks, this was the boy he had grown up with. This was the Robert Baratheon he had known and loved. So you can see how George is playing with the notion of there almost being two Roberts, with tension building around Ned being able to appeal to the true Robert. Yeah, George introduces conflict between the pair to make them both more vulnerable. The early friction regarding Daenerys' assassination leads to Ned giving up his handship. But like old friends that need and lean on each other, they're soon able to resolve their differences when Ned is in great need following the showdown with Lannister men and his broken leg. Just for a flash, the old Robert is back. However, after this fleeting tease of unity from George, selfish King Robert then returns and abandons his friend and responsibilities as ruler to go on that fateful hunting trip. The boar got Robert, fittingly when he was inebriated, albeit with a little help from Lancel's strong wine skin. The next time we see Robert, he's dying. And on his deathbed, George chooses to bring back the old Robert, the friend Ned called a brother. In a scene fraught with regret and perhaps some last-minute redemption, Robert tells Ned that he was wrong to want to kill Daenerys, and there was no one to tell me, no one but you, Ned, only you. He then goes on to confess that the realm, the realm knows what a wretched king I've been. Bad is Ares, the gods spare me. Yeah, Ned actually disagrees with this, and despite some points of comparison between Robert and Ares, I think so do we. Not so bad as Ares, your grace, says Ned. Not near so bad as Ares. And this really marks the first time we've seen Robert express care for the realm, and despite the loneliness of his later life, we're very glad that he got to share these moments with Ned before his death that night. Despite lots of opinions on Robert from other characters and the obvious insight throughout A Game of Thrones, still Robert's problems were defined best by Robert himself. I swear to you, I was never so alive as when I was winning this throne, or so dead as now that I've won it. And with Ned withholding the truth of Robert's children on his deathbed, while secretly amending the wording of his will and testament... In the end, Ned proved what Varys has said to be true. You will be the only true friend Robert Baratheon will have. After all, and in Cersei's words, Robert wanted to be loved, and she correctly sees this as the catalyst for his failures as a king. And so, from Demon of the Trident to King of Wine and Whores, here ends the story of Robert Baratheon. To lead us out, here's a reading of Robert's final scene in A Game of Thrones. Robert, Ned said in a voice thick with grief. You must not do this. Don't die on me. The realm needs you. Robert took his hand, fingers squeezing hard. You are such a bad liar, Ned Stark, he said through his pain. The realm. The realm knows what a wretched king I've been. Bad as Ares, God spare me. No, Ned told his dying friend. Not so bad as Ares, your grace. Not near so bad as Ares. Robert managed a weak smile. At the least, they will say, the last thing, this I did right. You won't fail me. You'll rule now. You'll hate it. Worse than I did. But you'll do well. Are you done with the scribbling? Yes, your grace. Ned offered Robert the paper. The king scrawled his signature blindly, leaving a smear of blood across the letter. The seal should be witnessed. Serve the boar at my funeral feast. Apple in its mouth, skin seared crisp. Eat the bastard. Don't care if you choke on him. Promise me, Ned. I promise. Promise me, Ned, Lyanna's voice echoed. The girl, Daenerys. 
let her live. If you can, if it... Not too late. Talk to them. Varys, little finger. Don't let them kill her. And help my son, Ned. Make him be... Better than me. God have mercy. They will, my friend. They will. The king closed his eyes and seemed to relax. Killed by a pig. Ought to laugh, but hurts too much. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed our look at Robert Baratheon. And many thanks to Jim McGeehan of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog for contributing two segments and recording them with us for this episode. Up next, we'll have an episode all about Rob Stark, so we hope you'll come back for that. Now, as usual, it's time to give credit where credit is due. Thanks, as always, to George R.R. R. Martin for giving us Robert and his rebellion, and to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use elements of his music in our production. And we want to end today with thanks and shout-outs to our patrons from the Valyrian Steel and Castle Steel levels. So thanks to Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron, Alexis, Amber, Cinder of the Citadel, Chris K, Jessica, Joe, June, Kurt, Mary H of House Stark, Monica, and Marge of the Mage. Also to Arrow Doe, Anne, Sully, Christina, Clay, Demetrios, Edwin, Faceless Miami Man, Jim, JT Was Here, Monaro Geek TV, Patrick, Scott, Tammy, Tim, and Sir Matt of Wearside. And finally, to Yoan Longbeard, the well-read wine gobbler from Ultima Thule, and to Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackrune, sworn alesmith to House Stark, Grand Master of the Zithomancers Guild, and Keeper of the Buzz. Obviously, let us know if I pronounced any of your names wrong, or if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, and of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Google+, or Tumblr. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time with Rob. Bye for now.